Good morning. This will begin the uh, Small Business Commission hearing. Uh, I'm Council Member Mark John, I chair of the Committee of Small Business. I'd like to welcome you to our hearing on a package of nine bills that are designed to improve the environment for small business in our city. Thank you for making the time for us today. Mom and pop shops frequently navigate an arcane maze of thousands of rules and regulations as they, as they set up their businesses. Building, sanitation, and zoning codes can cost local entrepreneurs thousands of dollars in startup costs as well as months and even years of invaluable time. That's why I sponsored Intro 1467, which would create an interactive website that would provide businesses with information about applicable laws, rules, penalties, and fines. It is absolutely vital that the small businesses can access and understand local regulation as swiftly as possible. In a similar vein, I am also proud to co-sponsor alongside my colleagues, Council Member Espinal and Yeager, Intro 1466, which would create a regulatory review panel that reviewed New York City's regulatory architecture in order to identify cure periods for certain violations. Another major area of concern that we have identified over the course of the last several years has been the issue of vacant storefronts. Two bills under consideration today will tackle the crisis head on by helping the city acquire a more holistic and comprehensive understanding of this problem. Intro 1472, sponsored by Council Members Rosenthal, Yeager, and the Speaker, will require the Department of Small Business Services to maintain a database of commercial properties, while Intro 1473, sponsored by Council Members Rosenthal, Rivera, Kalos, and the Speaker, would require regulate a registration of vacant storefront property. Additionally, Council Members Rivera, the Speaker, Yeager, Ampa, Ampre Sample, Levine, and Levine have introduced Intro 1089, which will require periodic surveys by SBS to assess the state of storefront businesses. We're also making efforts to facilitate the process by which local shops expand as small businesses are the lifeblood of employment in the city. Roughly nine out of every 10 employers in New York City has fewer than 20 employees. However, it can be a daunting prospect to expand your services, which is why Council Member Rosenthal, alongside the Speaker, has introduced Intro 1471, which requires SBS to offer business assistance. Expansion, however, is not the only concern. Sometimes just keeping your location can be a struggle. So to protect local institutions from unscrupulous landlords, Council Members Levine, Rivera, Powers, Rosenthal, and Ayala have introduced 1470, which would make low-cost legal services available to small business owners who are facing eviction proceedings. Intro 1410, sponsored by Council Member Gibson, has a similar intention. This bill would require a certification of no harassment before the approval of construction documents and demolition permits for commercial buildings. Lastly, we're seeking to address the issue of affordability. Intro 1408 by Council Members Espinal, Combo, and Chin would establish a requirement for affordable retail space at all development projects that receive city assistance. I could not be more proud to hold a hearing on such an exciting package of legislation. We want small businesses in New York City to be able to expand swiftly, comply with regulations easily, and address logistical and legal challenges with as little fuss as possible. Taken, to, taken together, these bills will provide vital support for mom and pop shops in a highly competitive and challenging climate. I'd like to thank the committee staff, Council Irene Bolofsky, Policy Analyst Michael Kurtz, as well as my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, for making this hearing possible. Finally, I would like to recognize the committee members that have joined us, and many more will, Council Members Ayala and Council Member uh, Gibson. I'd like to ask uh, Council Member Gibson to make a brief opening statement, if that's okay, Commissioner. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Jonai. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Commissioner Bishop. Um, it's good to be here. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I represent the 16th District in the Bronx, and I am grateful to be here for today's hearing of the Committee on Small Business. And I want to talk specifically about my bill that's on today's agenda, Intro 1410B, which will require a certificate of no harassment prior to the approval of construction documents or the issuance of permits for demolition or renovation of certain commercial buildings and broadening commercial tenant harassment to include acts or omissions causing a commercial tenant to vacate or to surrender or waive their rights. This bill will create a three-year certificate of no harassment pilot program for commercial buildings, which would require building owners to apply for a certificate of no harassment before obtaining Department of Buildings approval for construction documents or permits for covered work. Buildings would, would be those where a court finds commercial tenant harassment or those in a community district with a city-sponsored neighborhood-wide rezoning in the 60 months before or after the bill's enactment. If the Department of Buildings denies or rescinds a certificate of no harassment, the owner would pay a fine of $100 to $1,000 and not be approved for construction documents or permits for 12 to 24 months, with a building harassment index determining the fine and time period. The bill would also broaden the acts and omissions that constitute commercial tenant harassment to include those that cause or intend to cause a tenant to vacate or to surrender or waive their rights. Given the reality of massive development and rezonings throughout the city of New York, small businesses have the least amount of protections and regulations to safeguard them from the effects of the changes that occur when a neighborhood is rezoned. Commercial landlords often pressure and harass tenants as they seek to maximize their profits with rent increases through commercial business displacement. In addition to recognizing and thanking our speaker, Corey Johnson, for his leadership, I want to thank our chair of small business, council member Mark Joni, as well as all of my colleagues in the city council. We want to recognize and give a special recognition to Nicole Bramstead for working closely with our office on intro 1410. I also want to thank the legislative division and certainly many of our advocacy groups that joined us earlier this morning for uh, a very impactful rally. I want to thank ANHD, Brooklyn Legal Services, Chaya CDC, the CD Project of Urban Justice Center, Cooper Square Committee, Fourth Arts Block Municipal Arts Society, my group, Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, the New York City Artists Coalition, Street Vendor Project, and another Bronx-based group that I'm proud to work with, WEDCO. And we also want to recognize volunteers of legal services, VOLS. And certainly, coming on the cusp of a rezoning that I worked on in the Bronx, um, I think I learned a lot in my rezoning of the value of protecting commercial businesses. I've done walk throughs many times with organizations like WAMA, um, the United Auto Merchants Association, as well as you, Commissioner Bishop, and certainly uh, we're going to continue to do that, providing more services through SBS with a mobile unit, the commercial lease services unit, and many other aspects of helping our workers. Um, I do want to see an opportunity where many of our workers and tenants can ultimately become owners, um, and I think that should always be our goal. So I'm looking forward to today's hearing on this package of legislation. I want to thank you, Chair Joni, for your leadership, and I'm looking forward to seeing these bills pass and be codified in law, and really want to thank all of our advocacy groups for the work done on the ground every single day to protect all of our small businesses in the city of New York. Thank you, Chair Joni. Thank you, Council Member, and I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Rosenthal and Council Member Espinal, and Mr. Espinal would like to make an opening statement brief, if possible. Good morning, everyone. I'll be very brief, but first and foremost, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this hearing on these very important bills that I think will really support uh, our small business economy here in New York City. Uh, and before I move forward, I just want to also acknowledge and say hello to the New York City Artists Coalition, the New York City Hop Sally Alliance. We've been working very closely over the years on improving nightlife here in New York City. Uh, the development of affordable housing for residential tenants should not displace commercial tenants. That is why I'm proud to introduce Intro 1408, which will require any developer receiving a tax subsidy to be a responsible neighbor to both the people and small businesses that make up the community they would like to build in. 
Having a certain set aside of affordable units is not enough. When the market rate units still have the power to raise property values for the surrounding neighborhood, a select number of people will win the affordable housing lottery and find themselves in new units, but at what cost? The businesses they would be able to afford to shop at can be price gouged before these new tenants even get their keys. Chain stores often move into these vacancies, and then we see how an affordable housing development can displace a community just as easily as luxury housing. Conversations surrounding commercial rent control have been going on for a long time, with no sign of progress anytime soon. However, intro 1408 is a step in the right direction. Many new affordable housing developments have a ground floor retail, which presents the perfect opportunity for small businesses to stay in their neighborhoods at an affordable price. Just as we have set aside to address the affordability crisis for tenants, we must also have set aside to address the vacancy crisis for small businesses. I'm also introducing intro 1466, which will require city agencies to evaluate the viability of cure periods for all the different violations that can be issued to small businesses. The cost of doing business in the city is high, but astronomical rent is only part of the problem. Our mom and pops, with less staff and less bureaucracy, can sometimes fall down a wormhole of, a wormhole of noncompliance. These fines can quickly add up in extreme cases, lead a small business to close its doors for good. Our regulation and standards should be protecting consumers and punishing bad actors, not shuttering the storefronts of businesses we love. By giving the businesses a window of opportunity to correct the violation before being issued a fine, we are able to identify and support the small businesses that lost track of things from the big business that are looking to cheat our system. I look forward to hearing testimony on these bills and those of my colleagues as, as we continue to fight against the vacancy crisis here in our city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, I believe Council Member Rosenthal would like to say something as well. I just want to say I'm not going to give my opening statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wait till later because I really am looking forward to hearing from the commissioner and very much looking forward to hearing from the uh, retail um, business owners who are here today. And I want to thank you for coming out and thank the organizers for pulling together the rally we had on the steps of City Hall just now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member. And uh, just for the record, um, on Friday, we had our hearing on SBS's budget. Later that afternoon, uh, or in the evening, uh, I spoke to the commissioner about today's hearings. And over the weekend, we were in touch with the SBS staff, and as late as 10 p.m. last night, we were on the phone trying to work out details. This is an important hearing. SBS realizes the importance of it, and uh, I want to thank you, Commissioner, and your staff for working over the weekend after Friday's budget hearing uh, to prepare for this and um, outline the future of our small businesses, which are certainly uh, in dire straits. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, um, and good morning, everyone, and good morning, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee of on the small business. My name is Greg Bishop and I'm the commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. I am joined by- Commissioner, I'm sorry, Commissioner, uh, a oh, little protocol. We forgot to swear you in. Otherwise, okay. you have to do it all over again. All right. Sorry, if you please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Um, again, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. And um, uh, deviating a little bit from my remarks, uh, it, you are correct. We are, as an agency, very passionate uh, in terms of uh, what we can do to help small businesses. This hearing is very important and very timely. Uh, so looking forward to uh, your questions. Uh, as I said, small businesses are essential. Uh, to the local economy and character of our neighborhoods. Small business ownership and, and entrepreneurship can lift and help uplift generations of families while providing neighbors with essential goods, services, and job opportunities. And while we know many businesses face challenges in our competitive market and struggle to adapt to changes in the business environment, our agency wants to ensure that small businesses have the tools necessary to succeed. The underlying cause of these issues are complex and vary from neighborhood to neighborhood, corridor to corridor, and property to property. To address these challenges, this administration has invested in several programs designed to help businesses launch, grow, and operate more efficiently. 
At SBS, we are committed to providing businesses with services to improve outcomes for every step of their development. We accomplish this through a range of free services, including navigating government, comprehensive business education courses and trainings, and assistance with access to capital, all offered at our NYC Business Solutions Centers located throughout the five boroughs. We also rely on the expertise of local, on-the-ground partners, such as BIDS and other community-based organizations, some of them which are here today, to connect business owners with our existing services and work together to develop solutions to address the unique challenges faced by New York City's diverse neighborhoods and commercial corridors. We know that one of the biggest challenges business owners face is navigating the leasing process. To support businesses that are facing issues with their lease, we provide free legal services through our commercial lease assistance programs. Attorneys help businesses with understanding and negotiating new commercial leases, amending, renewing, or terminating an existing lease, and negotiating on behalf of the commercial tenant with their landlord, and providing advice and referral services when litigation cannot be avoided. This program is serving small business owners that have historically lacked access to quality services. Of the businesses served, 80% are minority owned and 60% are immigrant owned and nearly half are owned by women. Another common issue businesses face is navigating government. Uh, through the work of Small Business First, the administration implemented 30 commitments to reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses by making city regulations easier to navigate while still protecting the health and safety of New Yorkers. SB1's commitments were developed by gathering feedback from community stakeholders and more than 600 business owners, all of which have been implemented and are projected to save businesses $50 million annually. Business owners can connect with these regulatory resources through our online NYC business portal or directly at their door through our compliance, compliance advisor program. Compliance advisors are regulatory experts who provide an on-site consultation to help business owners comply with the city's regulatory requirements to avoid common violations. Since launching, compliance advisor, advisors have served over 5,000 small business owners. We also oversee the largest network of business improvement districts in the country. SBS provides the BID network and other community development organizations with technical assistance, grant opportunities, and capacity building services, which further strengthens the direct connections between our agency and our local small businesses. At SBS, we work with community partners to identify the needs of local commercial districts and plan targeted solutions through our Commercial District Needs Assessment, or CDNAs. CDNAs identified the strengths, the challenges, and opportunities within a commercial corridor to better inform subsequent investments. Last year, SBS shifted the focus of our Avenue NYC grant program from project-specific awards to long-term community commitments. The new Avenue NYC program allows community-based organizations the opportunity to hire a full-time program manager, conduct the CDNA in their neighborhoods, and implement programming based on the findings. To further increase the capacity of our community partners, SBS developed the Neighborhood 360 Fellows Program, which pairs 10 paid full-time neighborhood development professionals with local community-based organizations. The program not only provides local organizations with dedicated support for commercial revitalization projects, but also builds a pipeline of diverse talent in the neighborhood development field. SBS is also developing and testing solutions to help long-standing neighborhood business adapt to changing market conditions through our Love Your Local initiative. Your Love Your Local helps support small businesses through a promotional campaign and a competitive grant program that connects awardees with industry experts to determine and implement projects to help their business remain competitive in an ever-changing city. Through our first round of the program, SBS awarded up to $90,000 in grants to help 20 small businesses. This program will allow SBS to test interventions to help businesses remain competitive and scale up successful strategies through integration with our NYC Business Solutions Centers, local community groups, and other partners. We look forward to working with Council in consideration of the bills before the committee today. While we continue to review the details of the legislation, we share many of the Council's goals in offering it. This is especially true as it aligns with the efforts the city has made over the past five years to better assist businesses in areas like navigating, government, navigating regulations and negotiating leases, and to better assist neighborhoods in maintaining the vibrancy of the commercial districts. In particular, we agree that more data is needed to better fully understand the scale of commercial vacancies and address them. 
To that end, the administration will continue to actively work with you on a vacancy registry. Such a registry would be an important part of an effort to also pass a vacancy tax in Albany. This administration shares Council's belief in the importance of thriving small businesses in healthy commercial corridors, and we look forward to working with you and other advocates to create a fair environment for our small businesses. Thank you, and I will now take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We've had discussions often on the future of small businesses, and from discussions of box store competition, the internet consumer behavior changes, the regulations uh, that are imposed and mandates that are imposed on small businesses by this administration. And across the board in meeting uh, local mom and pop shop owners, the feedback that I consistently get is we want a happy employer, employee. We want to make sure that they have proper health coverage, that they're able to afford to provide for their families. We want sustainable employment with less turnover. And they're, the complaint is they can't do both. In this budget alone, there's a projected $1.8 billion increase in real estate taxes that will be passed on to our small businesses in one form or another. Rising costs in water and sewer, as well as minimum wage increases, paid family leave, sick leave, health care, which are wonderful and important programs that we need to provide our employees. When do we realize that too much is too much and we have to create a way where our businesses thrive and survive without the burden. To give, they have to also get something. And it seems like they're the piggy bank that we constantly go to and draw water from for our tax base and revenue source. When will this administration truly value our small businesses as a partner? And I know that you're hearing it, I'm hearing it, we all know it. When can we look to the forward to the day that there'll be real constructive dialogue that our small businesses will not only be heard, but will be given the equipment and the, the, the ability to be prosperous? And so I, I think, you know, uh, to answer your question, um, and, and to be clear, I think since the start of this administration, uh, we've heard from small businesses. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that um, in the previous administration, uh, many of our regulatory agencies had revenue targets. And one of the things that we heard from our small businesses was a hidden tax on their, um, on small businesses uh, to actually fund the city. Uh, the mayor was very clear when he created Small Business First that we needed to create opportunities to ensure the vibrancy of our small businesses because as you know, and we've had many conversations about this, small businesses are the economic backbone of New York City. Uh, they represent um, not only the, the, the small businesses are hiring New Yorkers, uh, but they're hiring within their local community. Uh, so we are fully invested in ensuring that our small businesses are, are successful. Uh, we've worked with our regulatory agencies through Small Business First uh, to reduce the impact of fines um, to uh, our small businesses. Um, have we reduced all of them? No. And we certainly, we continue uh, to work with uh, our panel and, and look at other areas that are barriers for small businesses. Um, and we continue to look at uh, any other areas that we can um, make an impact. So I would say to answer your question, uh, from the very start of this administration, uh, we want to make sure that we created a climate in New York City uh, that is uh, a climate that small businesses can be successful. Uh, we've made investments, uh, for example, and we could talk more about our commercial lease assistance program, uh, but that program wasn't around um, about a year ago. Uh, one of the reasons why we made that investment is because we actually worked with council to address the issue of tenant, uh, commercial tenant harassment. Um, and we wanted to make sure we provided the resources for our small businesses. Uh, as I indicated in my testimony, 
Uh, a lot of our small businesses are micro businesses, and you and I have had conversations about that as well. Uh, we're not talking about franchises. We're not talking about uh, the larger corporations who have the access to uh, line of, lines of credit, uh, attorneys on retainers. Uh, our small businesses are mom and pop, maybe two or three individuals, uh, maybe one person and with two staff uh, who's really working hard uh, to build that business. So we want to make sure we're the agency that provides the services uh, necessary for their growth. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, I agree with you. SB1 was um, the start of SB1 and its intentions were um, warranted. But in four years and $36 million later, of the 5,300 or 6,000, we're still not exactly sure on the number of rules and regulations that small business have to comply with, all we've done is modify 80. And that typically means we made them worse. We haven't removed a single requirement or a burden on our small businesses, we've only added. In the last four years, we have added more rules and regulations. We haven't removed a single rule, a single regulation. We modified, and correct me if I'm wrong. And so I, I, will, I will correct you, because uh, one of the things, uh, just for the record, uh, we, and we will we can continue having this conversation, and uh, as I said on Friday, um, I'm willing to sit down with your team and my team uh, to really look at the portal uh, the portal is, it's, uh, as with any technology, uh, you know, when Windows 95 came out, it didn't stay Windows 95. Every year we added more features and we just added more uh, revisions. It's the same thing with our business portal. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to ensure was using technology to raise awareness uh, and transparency to the regulatory environment. Uh, are we uh, finished? No, we still have more work to do and we'll continue to uh, uh, fine tune that portal based on the feedback of our small business owners. Uh, so I'd be happy to sit down with you and figure out if there's any more uh, changes that we need to make and also include the small business community to ensure that we're uh, covering and uh, uh, bring, raising transparency to in areas that uh, they may have issues with. Uh, to your point about the regulations, um, just to be clear, the, 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 the 5,000 um, number is the rules of the city of New York. Uh, they don't necessarily apply to all small businesses. As I said, if you're a retail business, you may have to uh, comply with one or two of those regulations versus if you're an auto repair shop, uh, versus if you're dealing with uh, hazardous chemicals. Um, we have the portal, uh, if you're looking to start a business, uh, you can, or if you're operating a business, you can put in the type of business that you have and you'll be able to see what are the regul regulations that you are responsible for. And just a reminder, uh, some of those regulations uh, affect the health and safety of New Yorkers. Some of those regulations require, for example, restaurants not to have rodents, uh, restaurants uh, to keep food at a certain temperature. Uh, so I don't think we want to modify those rules. But I, to your point, I think we want to modify the rules that will require, for example, a small business to have to go to one agency and take the same documentation and go to another agency uh, when nothing has changed. And that is the type of uh, uh, bureaucracy that we're looking to eliminate or modify uh, to streamline the uh, engagement that small business owners have with city government because we know small businesses and the owners, uh, their time is valuable and we don't want to have them spending the entire day uh, running from agency to agency. Thank you, Commissioner. I agree with you. We certainly don't want to jeopardize the health and safety of New Yorkers. Uh, those rules are there for their protection. But in the four years, can you think of one rule that was removed by SBS or SB1? So I think there's, there's a number of things that we've done. Uh, for example, uh, when we first came into, uh, uh, when Small Business First was created, uh, what the city did was uh, create a, almost like a SWAT team called the New Business Acceleration Team. Uh, why did we create that? Because interactions with specific agencies, uh, they did not have the infrastructure to deal with businesses. Uh, so for example, uh, the health department, we had uh, staff stationed at SBS. Uh, and when a business needed an inspection, we would deploy them from SBS. The health department has built out their infrastructure. Uh, so now the health department has a, a whole unit uh, that's, uh, that 
that works with small businesses. Uh, so we no longer need to provide that service. Uh, we worked with um, the uh, Department of Buildings and the fire department. Uh, if you're a restaurant and you're looking to uh, get your range hood inspected, you would have to file uh, you, the, your documents with the Department of Buildings and also take that same information and file it with the, with the fire department. Each of those costing money. Uh, so we were able to get, work with the fire department to build out a system uh, where now uh, you only have to file with the fire department and the Department of Buildings is actually uh, notified. Um, I could go on and on in terms of the things, the ways we have actually streamlined that process, but the, the reason why we were able to identify those areas is because we heard from small business owners. Uh, right now, for example, we're looking at sidewalk cafes and what it takes to actually get a license to install a sidewalk cafe. Um, so again, uh, this is not just government, us looking at our regulations. Uh, we uh, encourage and want feedback from the small business community and, and certainly from your, from your uh, point of view. Uh, if there are other regulations that our, business, our small business communities are complaining about, uh, we, we meet uh, with the regulatory agencies uh, on a regular basis uh, to review er other areas that we can take a look at. Uh, so happy to continue that conversation. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, I know your passion about small businesses and your heart is in the right place and we need to do more. But this administration removed the moratorium on a signage sign from the previous administration and hundreds and hundreds of businesses were issued violations that started at 5,000 and went up to 20,000. It took a year almost to have that moratorium put back on. Those violations closed businesses. Where was the consumer um, health risk? Because the signage print was larger than 12 square feet, a, sign, a law that was in place in 1961. What was the risk to consumers that warranted a $20,000 fine and allowed 311 to be weaponized in putting small businesses out of business. Four years, hundreds and hundreds of violations. We didn't act swiftly enough. Clear Curbs, a six-month pilot program that put small businesses out of business. No parking from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. on a theory. How to get congestion, how to alleviate congestion. Where were the voices of those small businesses that were literally shut down and they they took losses of more than 40 percent we look at road dieting that impacts our commercial corridors i have a proposed road diet coming into a main thoroughfare in my district against opposition from every business owner. We have the Metro North coming in, a, a well-embraced infrastructure improvement. It'll be up and running by 2022, the end of. Instead of looking at the feasibility and what the impact it will have on our commercial corridor by getting rid of two lanes and creating one, on a thoroughfare that is going to lead to a Metro North station against the wishes of our small businesses that are complaining that we, know we don't have adequate parking now. I don't have the ability to receive my deliveries now, let alone if you remove an extra driving lane which, which allowed them to double park in most times to drop off and pick up. And we're so ready with our traffic agents to the moment 
your meter expires, the moment your double parts have picked something up, it's a $115 fine. How many times before you stop at that same pizzeria, and I know that that's in a sense of public safety, but it's a gotcha at every corner. And if we truly want to hear from our small businesses and want to value them as the partner that they are, and value them for the contributions they make, not only to revenue, but employment, and the commercial corridors that they create that make our neighborhood such a great place to live and thrive, we actually have to do something when we hear them. And that's just a few that I brought up. We have a lot of work to do, Commissioner. Time is not on our side. 50% of small businesses never make it to year five. 80% of restaurants that open up never make it to year five. And I can't say that they all have flawed business models. We've made it an unfriendly business environment for them to thrive. So um, th there was multiple uh, questions packed into your statement, uh, Chair, and I, I'd like to just start by saying uh, we share the same goal. We want to make sure that our small businesses are successful in New York City. Um, I would say that uh, as, our, as a service agency, uh, our job is to ensure uh, that small businesses that start uh, are empowered uh, to survive beyond the first five years, which is why we make a number of investments on our business education. Uh, so everything from um, our programs in terms of how to uh, develop strategies to grow your business, our programs in terms of how to have an online presence, uh, because as you know, uh, technology has changed the way uh, certain uh, sectors have uh, are doing business. Um, uh, we've made investments in, uh, in innovating um, uh, our courses to address the changing consumer behavior. Uh, I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, you know, we have a, a, a relationship with council that I think is important. As we uh, as we look at different areas where there there are significant barriers, working with council uh, to address those. So, for example, with, with the signage, uh, you know, there uh, and 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 not the, the Department of Buildings has an important job, and that's to ensure the safety um, of New Yorkers. When we walk into buildings, when we walk on sidewalks, we don't really think about whether or not this building was built to code, et cetera. We expect it to. Um, in Bay Ridge in Brooklyn, uh, there was a, a couple incidents or an incident where a sign just fell off uh, and actually injured uh, two uh, uh, pedestrians walking. Uh, so the Department of Buildings, when a, a call is made about a sign that's improperly uh, installed, they have to respond. Now, Commissioner, that, that, I, I, that, I, I, that yeah. I'm sorry. Commissioner, I'm, I'm not referring to the health and safety of pedestrians that a sign may fall. Those violations were issued, were explicit. The law said no more than 12 square foot of print. They had 14, 16, and 20 square feet of print. And they were issued a violation for non-compliance. This wasn't about, will the sign, is the sign safely, is, is stable or not? Is it in jeopardy of falling and hurting someone? It was about the print size. You were, you were referencing the, the fines that are associated to those small businesses, and the fines that were associated were, were uh, uh, signs uh, installed, work without a permit uh, fines. Um, I, we can, you know, the, 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 the point that, that I'm making is that we recognize that this was a challenge for small businesses, uh, that they were uh, individuals or, or, or something happening that 311 was being weaponized. Um, we worked with, um, you know, you and, and uh, Council Member Espinal. Uh, matter of fact, it was Council Member Espinal's district. Uh, he was, when I was out there, he pointed out that that, that was an issue. Um, and we certainly, uh, I would say, um, in, in, in terms of this administration, uh, we worked closely with all the regulatory agencies that were responsible for this. Uh, and we moved as quickly as we could, uh, working with council to pass a bill uh, that I think um, the small business community appreciated, uh, the advocates appreciated, 
Um, you know, I would like to see that bill, uh, I would like to see more because one of the challenges I heard from small businesses is actually the cost of getting a licensed sign uh, installer. Uh, so that's just a number of ways um, we work closely together. So as I said, uh, when there are challenges that are facing small businesses, uh, for example, you mentioned clear curbs. Uh, we, as an agency, we depend on our local organizations. Uh, there are many advocates that we work closely with. Uh, we heard from our local business improvement districts that this was a challenge uh, that to small businesses. Uh, I reached out to my, count my counterpart at the Department of Transportation. Uh, we did a walkthrough, you and I, uh, in Queens and talked to a, a lot of the small businesses and heard the impact. I sent uh, and I communicated that impact um, and the administration was receptive to the fact that um, this pilot was affecting small businesses and we made those change. Uh, so I guess the, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we as an administration, we care a lot about small businesses and where we hear there are challenges either on the regulatory side, policy side, uh, or even on, for example, access to capital, et cetera, uh, because we have not, and we, could, we, will, we can have this conversation uh, later on about capital to small businesses. Uh, we wanna make sure that we do as much as possible to, to working with council uh, to address those um, challenges uh, and to make it easier for small businesses to operate in New York City. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to acknowledge that Council Members Levine and Perkins have joined us, and I believe Council Member Rosenthal would like to, and Jaeger just walked in. Thank you for joining us, Council Member Jaeger. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for all your work on this effort. I'm looking through your testimony and seeing, you know, a wide variety of programs that SBS has implemented to try to get at the variety of issues that um, the small businesses face. Um, I wanted to ask, do you know how much money is collected from fines on uh, our small businesses for last fiscal year, this year, year to date? Um, so I, I don't have uh, last fiscal year. What I can say is that uh, last year, I believe it was either last year or the year before, when we did a look, when we did take a look at the fines collected by our regulatory agency, uh, we saw a forty-five million dollar reduction uh, of fines. Um, so uh, that that stems from the start of the administration um, to a, a point of either last year or the year before. Uh, but we can uh, get back to you in terms of the actual count. Uh, but the, and the reason, and one of the largest reasons for that was because the mayor made a, uh, a, an effort uh, to direct those regulatory agencies to re reduce the revenue targets. Um, and, I, and that was a direct result of hearing from the small business community and the advocates uh, that the agencies that were doing the inspections uh, were, you know, basically, um, in, in the previous administration was finding them for any and, and, and everything. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that, uh, to meet their revenue targets, so we wanted to make sure that we loosened um, uh, the, the targets uh, on those particular agencies. Mm -hmm. um, okay, it'd be great to see those numbers. I'm just, we uh, passed a law a couple years ago on uh, the dismissal rates for um, violations, so we could have old uh, tell us how many violations were issued to a, a small business, and then of those, how many were then dismissed for all the variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And it's actually worth looking at um, for DOMH, in fiscal year 17, 28,000 violations were dismissed uh, because there was no violation and dismissed on the merits of the violation. Um, yeah, 2,700 dismissed, no prima facie case. That was 2017. In 2018, 26,000 dismissed um, because there was no violation really. And year to date, 18,000 have been dismissed. 
And the reason I think that's important is because what I've heard from, this would be on restaurant owners, because mm -hmm. it's DOH and H. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that um, it's really hard on the small business owners to have to you know, take off a day of work to go to Oath. And I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to explore that issue a little bit more and to understand better um, how we can encourage the um, health inspectors to not put business owners in that situation. So that um, so yes. So again, uh, as I said, small business first was our first attempt uh, to to help the small business community. It's not the only attempt, and we will continue looking at different ways we can eliminate barriers. Uh, one of the things we did hear from uh, small business owners uh, when we sat down with them was consistency. Uh, so when inspectors come in, yes. they need to be consistent. Um, and part of our 30 initiative was to ensure uh, a continuous training of inspectors. Um, I, I, I hate to say this, but we also heard customer service um, having inspectors that understand that I'm a, the only business owner, I'm the only in, person right now, so figuring out ways to communicate to business owners, in, inform them of what you're doing, et cetera. Uh, so that was one of the findings that we found, and we um, made sure that all the inspectors at all the different agencies were, were trained in, in uh, business customer service. Um, we also heard about creating uh, flexible ways of responding uh, to a violation. Uh, so uh, in SB1, and we worked with Oath, um, you do not have to actually show up in person. You have other ways of, um, of, of, of responding to a violation, including um, online and including um, uh, fax and, and, and telephone. Uh, but we can look at you know, uh, other ways we can make it easier. Uh, to, be, you know, to be frank, I, I want to make sure that business owners don't get uh, you know, violations. That's the point. Right? We want yeah. to make sure that we bring transparency. You know, the chair has uh, um, on numerous occasions talked about uh, being transparent about what rules and regs you are responsible for. That is why we have the compliance advisors. Uh, so businesses can contact our staff. We can come out. And what we're doing, we're doing a data-driven approach. Uh, we're looking at the most common violations of per fiscal year. Uh, we're looking at to see what um, what businesses, um, and when we launch the compliance advisory program, uh, what are the top violations? Uh, so for example, with retail and consumer affairs, it's usually the unit pricing. Like you have to have on all your products, pricing on all your products. Um, you know, so we look at, at those common violations. We will look at it again uh, to get your information as well. Um, and then we'll see if there's something else that's now the, the top uh, in the top 10 that we need to educate our business owners on. So um, you know the top, do you know the top three uh, agencies or reasons? You just gave a great example of one from DCA, um, top violations that are issued. Uh, so it depends on, on the sector and it depends on, on the agency. Um, for example, in, with restaurants, uh, it's typically um, there's there's a number of things. It's typically uh, your particular. Um, uh, I'm sorry. The the wash. Uh, the, I don't know the oh, exact. Oh, sorry. I'm not. I'm now. You're getting way. I go down rabbit holes, but that's yeah, real. Just, okay. Um, <laughs> hang on one second. What I I just simply meant. What are the top uh, in terms of agencies? Which agency? Um, puts out the most, gives out the most violations. Oh. Is it DOH? Uh, so I, I, don't have, I don't have that information in front of me. What, what I will say is that there, obviously there's a lot of restaurants in New York City, um, but we, I'll tell you the agencies that we work closely with, uh, Department of Health, uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, Department of Buildings, okay. um, and the Fire Department. Uh, they all have um, uh, interaction with our businesses. Uh, so they have a role to play in terms of how businesses operate. Um, so, but uh, we can get back to you in terms of which agency uh, issues the most violations. Yeah, I think it would be worth looking at. Um, do you mind if I ask just a few more? T 
two more, and then we're going to go to other. Okay, sorry. Um, do you have any measures of success of the programs you've implemented? Sure. I mean, one of the things that uh, we announced last week uh, was because we completed the first 30 uh, uh, initiatives of Small Business First, uh, we are now looking at, the, uh, and based on either the violations that we help businesses avoid, uh, the violations um, that um, we've uh, either streamlined, et cetera, we now project a $50 million annual savings uh, to small businesses. Uh, obviously, we are now going to take a look at the, the additional regulatory environment uh, to see if there's anything else that we can be working on. Um, you know, can you provide us with that information? Yes, we can. Great. Um, you know, we also, in looking at the portal, for example, one of the things we heard, um, you know, it is the, the city of, we have multiple agencies that businesses have to interact with. Um, and uh, it, w it was a Herculean, Herculean effect, uh, uh, effort to actually get all the data that businesses need to pay attention to into one place. Uh, so I just want to make sure people understand that if you're a, bus if you're a business owner and you do not have an account uh, on nyc.gov slash NYC business, um, you really need to create that account. Uh, because now, you not only can you see the permits that you have, uh, you can see when you need to renew it. Uh, and the next versions will be for, for you to be able to renew those online. Uh, if you're a restaurant, one of the things we've heard from the restaurant community is when I'm going in front of my community board, that's the first time I'm hearing that there were X amount of three woman complaints against my restaurant. Uh, we've bring in, we brought transparency to that. Uh, so if you have an, uh, an account, you can see uh, all the uh, three woman complaints coming into your restaurant. Again, everything that we heard uh, came and was sourced from listening to small businesses okay. and listening to some of the, and in hearings like these where we hear of some concerns. So we would be happy uh, to sit down with everyone uh, to figure out if you are hearing something different from the business community that we have not addressed uh, to actually uh, start looking at those issues. The last issue along those lines is just a matter of nomenclature that I've heard from the LGBT community um, uh, discomfort with the expression mom and pop shops. And that, you know, it's important to recognize that uh, to be more gender neutral. So our <laughs> thank you. micro businesses. Micro businesses. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Chair. you. Thank you, Council Member. You brought up some great points, and I'm looking forward to uh, further investigating the number of violations that were dismissed. And 28,000 is a considerable amount of violations by one department or agency. Uh, Council Member uh, Gibson, I think you had a question. Thank you again, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Um, I had specific questions related to uh, the bill that I have on the agenda which is a pilot certificate of no harassment for commercial businesses. And I'm not sure to the extent of um, how familiar you are with the recent uh, passage of legislation that was codified that relates to residential uh, certificates of no harassment. We are currently in the pilot phase of that. And there are uh, several community boards that are in the first pilot and two of mine around the Jerome Inwood area, uh, Bronx Community Boards 4 and 5 are a part of that pilot. So while a lot of the enforcement and work um, around certificates of no harassment are really the Department of Buildings, but because in this instance we're looking at commercial certificate of no harassment, obviously um, it calls for SBS to work very closely with DOB. So while your testimony as Councilmember Rosenthal alluded speaks to a lot of the existing SBS programs, I wanted to ask uh, two questions about the current protections or what we have within our toolbox today that helps businesses who are in fear of displacement. Um, I think, as I mentioned in my opening, I've learned a lot around my rezoning. It's something I never want to go through ever again. Mm -hmm. It took me three years, and for the remainder of my term here, I have to make sure that everything we agreed to is implemented. So it is a lot of work and a lot of detail. And what I've learned in my walkthroughs with you and your administration 
or we have different businesses. So I have one business who was able to get a renewal of his lease for 10 years, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. I have another business that renewed for five years, but then I found businesses where the landlord has already expressed an interest in selling, so they have a certain amount of time left on their lease. Um, but then I also have a lot of businesses along Jerome in the Bronx that don't have a lease at all. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just month to month to month. Mm -hmm. And the uncertainty is extremely, you know, real for them, particularly when many of them are using that as a lifeline to take care of their families. So I guess my first question is, what do we have today within our toolbox that can help a business that fears that they are going to be displaced by their landlord? Right. So, uh, and thank you very much, and uh, it's been uh, terrific working with you and, and your team as well. Um, you've been a strong advocate for small businesses in your community. Um, you know, we worked with council uh, actually at the very start of this administration um, to pass the commercial tenant harassment bill. Um, uh, before, prior to that, there were no laws that actually tried to put some uh, structure to what harassment, commercial harassment, um, what, what that looked like. Um, partnering uh, with council, uh, we then launched the commercial uh, lease assistance program uh, where we, um, in the past at SBS, we were provide free legal assistance to actually understand the structure, maybe review a, a lease, uh, but not negotiate, and maybe review contracts. What we did was we made an investment knowing that we needed to provide uh, attorneys to your, to, to your point, to small businesses, to help them actively negotiate um, their leases. I think a lease is the, the biggest um, you know, deterrent to either harassment or displacement, um, to your point. Um, you know, there are state laws that, you know, we are not, uh, at this point, uh, if a landlord decides not to issue a lease, uh, there really isn't anything because of state rule laws that we can do to tell a landlord they have to issue a lease. However, if a landlord is open to issuing a lease, uh, we certainly have uh, the legal services available. Uh, and where we have seen uh, businesses that used our legal services, we have seen outcomes like 10-year leases, uh, which is very much so helpful for a small business, especially when they're looking to uh, project uh, in the outer years uh, what, they need to, what they need to have in terms of sales, employees, et cetera. Uh, consistency on a lease, uh, on, a lease on, on pricing um, is one thing. One of the things that we're looking at as well is figuring out ways to, to, to look at the, the lease environment. Uh, we have not talked about that. Uh, to your point, you know, different landlords use different types of leases uh, to help educate our small businesses on what a standard lease looks like. Um, so we'd be happy to continue working with council uh, to figure out ways we can actually help businesses who are at the start of a process. Now, if you're a business currently and you have a lease, and your landlord is pressuring you to leave, that is where the commercial lease assistance program uh, comes in. Now, since we've launched this program, uh, about 25, 24% of the use of what we've seen uh, our lawyers used for is related to harassment. Uh, most of it, though, is related to repairs that were not done. Uh, so the lease requires the landlord to do a certain amount of repairs. They're not doing it. Um, so those are the type of activities we, we've seen. Um, you know, the rest has all been either new leases uh, or uh, some type of um, lease review or, or something related to the lease itself. Well, I think it's also particularly um, challenging because many of the small businesses that I'm most familiar with are immigrant um, businesses where they have a small amount of employees. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is generational where, you know, grandparents and others, you know, carry the business. So I am supportive of a lot of the efforts and I've seen what SBS has done. I certainly think that, you know, we would agree that we can obviously do a lot more um, because many of the businesses that I represent are just not simply covered by having a lease. Um, what happens in instances, and this is really the, the mechanism and the basis behind the certificate of no harassment, when you actually have demonstrate, demonstrated cases of harassment, there's just persistent harassment by some of the same owners, and you know, in many of our small businesses, you have an owner that owns several businesses, particularly in my area of the auto repair and tire shops. So it's one landlord that owns, you know, multiple businesses. But what happens in instances where 
we, the city, know that this particular owner has been known to harass um, his or her tenants, and we have documented, you know, records and proof of that. You know, what type of measures do we have that we can protect those small businesses, but also go after the owners? I think, you know, by using um, a mechanism like certificate of no harassment, where we are working with DOB in terms of not issuing permits to do work, that's something that can drive out those bad neighbors, mm -hmm. but what else do we have where we can help some of our small mom and pops that will tell us, I've been harassed, this one has been harassed. You know, there's like a, a whole village of businesses that have been known to be harassed by their owners, but what types of protections do we have to really help them in that situation? So I, I think, you know, um, in looking at uh, the different types of harassment, similar to, you know, working with, with uh, council uh, to create the tenant harassment bill, we'd be happy to work with you to, to look at uh, the, the existing law and see if there's any type of harassment that's not being covered for that. Uh, if there is harassment that's happening, that's covered by the existing law, um, you know, our CLA program goes up to the point of litigation. So we'll be able to um, uh, at least let the, the, the business owner know their rights um, and direct them in terms of what they need to do uh, uh, to defend their rights. Um, I think the, the, you know, we would have to have a conversation in terms of resources uh, to talk about litigation. Uh, but in some cases, and, and, and I have seen it happen already, uh, the conversation changes when a lawyer actually uh, is present. Um, and I think, you know, uh, when landlords know that a small business owner has uh, you know, the resources available to effectively defend um, some type of harassment, uh, the behavior changes. Uh, but currently, we only work uh, prior to litigation. Um, so, you know, I'd be happy to, to uh, as we continue discussing these bills, uh, to look at the existing law and figure out if there's things that you're seeing that's not covered by this law and then what else we can do to help those small businesses in, in those situations. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we'll keep talking about my bill as well as the package of legislation and I, I turn it back over to, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member, uh, Council Member Ayala. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. My, my, well, good morning. Well, yeah, you're right. It's still good morning. Um, my question is really around the uh, commercial lease assistance program. Can you tell us how many businesses actually benefited from that service last year? So right now we have about 400 cases uh, open. And how many uh, of those cases ended up in litigation? Do you know? So actually, um, I, I don't. I don't know if we have. Uh, most of the cases, as I said, uh, were related to new leases um, or some type of lease review or lease um, uh, agreement. Uh, so what, you know, when we launched the program, uh, one of the things we thought we would see was, you know, a huge amount of harassment related uh, cases, but that's not the case. We've seen uh, instead business owners use the program to effectively negotiate a better lease upfront um, of the 24% 20, of cases that had some type of landlord harassment breach of contract, as I said, it was more so related to repairs uh, that the tenant uh, wanted the landlord to do that was covered under the lease that the, the landlord was refusing to do. Um, so w I can get back to you in terms of what has actually been referred to litigation, but I think it's a very, very, very small number. So I, I was. I think that Councilmember Levine will be back to talk a little bit more about Intro for, um, 1470, which would require um, free of charge legal representation, right? Because what we're offering now is pretty much um, advisory in nature, right? The, uh, the you don't you don't represent in court, right? So sorry, yes. So so our our program is an attorney uh, that's dedicated to the business owner. Um, and that attorney is as if you had the attorney on retainer, you could call that attorney, et cetera, um, until you get to the point of litigation. Um, so we are providing free legal services. I, I think the bill uh, that we're talking about right now now steps into litigation, um, and that is something that we, um, 
uh, we do not provide at this time. Do you have any concerns about the bill? Um, there's there's some concerns about um, you know in terms of budget uh, resources. Uh, I think you know we would have to take a look at um, that closer. And as I said, um, you know we want to make sure that um, right now the the funding that we have uh, covers the interaction that. Uh, the attorneys have with the businesses prior to litigation. Uh, I don't think anyone wants to be in a litigious um, uh, situation, uh, and I think our goal is really to solve that particular, whatever the particular issue, uh, prior to uh, getting into the litigation. Understood. Now, in regards to the um, SBS 360 program, is that a permanent program or is that a pilot program? Uh, so the it is a. Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's a pilot program. It was related. It was the program was created as a result of um, you know some of the work that we were doing in the different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, as I said in my testimony, uh, we have uh, uh, made some changes to our Avenue NYC grant program, um, which is federally funded, uh, to actually mimic some of the uh, success that we've had uh, through uh, the Neighborhood 360 program. Uh, so, for example, working with local organizations uh, to help uh, empower them to actually do uh, the commercial district needs assessment uh, is one of them. We did that through the Neighborhood 360 program. Uh, we've recognized that data is very important uh, so to the point of uh, this hearing. Uh, in order to come up with effective solutions, uh, every neighborhood is different in terms of why we're seeing different uh, challenges. Uh, so we need to better understand that, and the best way to understand it is to work with local partners, empower them to actually do the studies that uh, would be necessary uh, to then for us to come up with effective solutions. Uh, so we have uh, a way uh, through Avenue NYC. It is a, com a competition, uh, but we have a way to continue funding across the city uh, 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 support for local organizations. I actually have one in my district, and I love it. I think that... The small businesses are also love it. They have been um, really excited to have a partner in the community who they can communicate some of their concerns with, who will also help you know market them a little bit better. Um, but my concern is that it's limited to a, just a, a specific corridor, right, or two. Is there any intent to add more to uh, to to add an addition to that? Yeah. So you know, and the. Uh, I'm glad you raised the um, the CDNA that happened in, in your district in the Neighbor 360 program. Part of the program is to build the capacity of local organizations, uh, so that way we step in at the front end uh, to seed, uh, you know, not only the building the capacity, uh, but also empower those local organizations to get additional funding, uh, in you know, from uh, private funders uh, to continue uh, to continue the work. Um, we have uh, we started off with with specific neighborhoods and we've now expanded it um, through Avenue NYC um, and um, helping different corridors because there are some corridors that do not have either a business improvement district or a local uh, uh, development corporation uh, that has the capacity. So we want to make sure that uh, we build that type of capacity across the city in neighborhoods that may not have. Uh, organizations as strong as yours in your in your particular district. Well, I just want to say thank you. I don't have any further questions, but I wanted to acknowledge all of the hard work that you have uh, invested in, in, I know, in my district. Uh, I've worked, been in the council for over 13 years, and I haven't seen the level of commitment that I have from anyone else, uh, and so I wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Commissioner, uh, when it, in, respir in reference to Intro 1049, how long do you think it would take for the administrator, the, this administration, uh, to come up with the state of storefront survey? For, for 1049, I think, um, you know, the, the, the intent of the, the bill, which is uh, to get data, we agree with. Um, we want to, and I think in parallel, we've been having conversations about uh, coming up with a storefront registry, and we've been working with council on and what that looks like. Um, I don't have, um, you know, any. I, I can't tell you how long that's going to take. Uh, obviously, there are other agencies that um, interact with with businesses differently in terms of either uh, property or or, or block and lots. Uh, so we're looking across the the uh, city in terms of um, which agencies we can work with closely. 
to get that information. I know there's some third party um, you know, data out there um, that um, certainly we, we have been in conversations with about leveraging. Uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at all a, uh, angles in terms of how we can get uh, not only reliable data, uh, but consistent data. In, re in reference to intro 1471, in your experience, what types of training and counseling makes the biggest difference for local entrepreneurs? More importantly, what type of training is most cost effective? So, and I'm glad you mentioned cost effective because we, you know, when we look at our, our, our services, we want to make sure that it's scalable. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, it's accessible. Uh, you know, we try to offer our programs uh, uh, all throughout the day, uh, either in the morning, uh, midday, afternoons, evenings, uh, to make sure that we make it accessible for small business owners to, to attend the courses, uh, because sometimes they are the only ones that are, are running their business, so we want to make sure that they have time to run their business and also, um, you know, get the information that they need. Uh, some of the things that we've seen uh, that small business owners, in terms of when you talk about um, uh, the different type of training, understanding your books. Um, you know, a lot of small business owners, um, you know, in, in some cases, we want to make sure they understand, you know, the right po point of sale system, uh, how that point of sale system can, um, you know, put the information in uh, to, uh, you know, whether it's QuickBooks or whatever it is, an accounting system, so they understand uh, their sales really quickly. Uh, through Love Your Local, uh, again, that was an investment uh, to help us innovate the education offerings that we will, uh, we could potentially offer. One of the things that we found was the businesses that had uh, the assessment from uh, the business expert, uh, those businesses did not have an inventory management system. In everything uh, that we do, we try to figure out how, uh, what are some of the challenges that businesses face on the back office. Uh, and then figure out how we, as a as a city, can provide uh, those uh, trainings. So, for example, knowing that technology is changing, uh, if you're a restaurant, if you're even if you're a bodega, if you do not have an online presence, um, you know that is detrimental to your success. Uh, people who are looking for particular products will the first thing they'll do is go online. Um, so we want to make sure that, and we have programs, for example, on search engine optimization on how to actually ensure that when someone uh, you know, puts in, uh, I'm looking for X, uh, that your result will come up um, on the front page. Uh, we also have uh, programs uh, for customized training. So all these new technologies mean that you have to train your employees, uh, and that's an additional cost. Uh, so we have something called customized training, where the, the city will cover up to 75% of the cost uh, if you're installing uh, some type of new system. So again, there's uh, a lot of the work that we do is focused on you know, understanding uh, you know, uh, your financials uh, to better make informed decisions. And I think um, as I, I read these bills, the intent of it is really to make it easier and transparent for businesses to understand, understand their expenses. Uh, so either we can reduce those expenses, uh, whether it's on the regulation side or whether it's on um, uh, the operation side, uh, or we can figure out ways to actually help. Uh, one of the things that we did not talk about is healthcare, uh, the cost of actually uh, paying for healthcare for your employees. Uh, we have heard that from small businesses, uh, so we are also looking at that and figure out ways we can make it easier um, and, and cheaper uh, for small businesses to uh, 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 help their employees with healthcare. Thank you, Commissioner. We've been joined by Council Member Powers, and I believe Council Member Levin has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, nice to see you again. It's been only a couple of days. Um, I, 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 uh, how was, was your weekend? <laughs> it was good. How was yours? <laughs> it was wonderful. It's working. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about um, uh, Intro 1049. And um, and just in general, I'm sorry, sorry, intro 1470, excuse me, 1470, um, which is around legal services. Uh, you mentioned your testimony of commercial lease assistance program. Is this administration examined um, uh, what overall legislative framework uh, ought to be pursued or, or examined or contemplated when it comes to um, small business uh, rent 
let law. Um, you know, I don't. Some of it is city law. Some of it can be state law. Um, but have you? Has this administration kind of examined what what ought to be the? Um, well, first off, if if there's if the status quo is acceptable or unacceptable, and then if it's unacceptable, what l legal changes, law changes should be made? Yeah, so, uh, so a couple things, and, and I think it's related to um, this bill. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to make sure it's on the record that anytime a business closes in New York City, um, uh, it's, I say it's personal for me, you know, because I think about uh, the fact that, you know, this business owner put in their, 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 their sweat, um, you know, their life earnings uh, to launch this business, um, and any time a business closes, um, it hurts, and and we understand, um, you know, uh, for that business owner, and I could say every, you know, all the facts that I have in terms of reduction of fines, re you know, et cetera, uh, but if you're still getting a fine, none of this really matters, right? So we want to make sure that um, that I, I am sympathetic to, to the issue at hand. Um, there's a couple things. One, we have been, and we've been talking about a vacancy registry, um, because a storefront uh, vacancy registry, uh, because in any particular commercial quarter, there's different reasons why those storefronts are vacant. Um, you know, you do have, and the narrative that's been in the media is that, um, you know, there are landlords who one minute your rent is $6,000, and the next minute, at the end of your lease, it's now $12,000. Um, and uh, there are, but there are landlords who um, have a viable uh, storefront, uh, but they don't have the capital, for example, to upgrade that storefront uh, to attract the right tenant. Mm -hmm. or, or there may be um, a landlord that may not understand how to actually attract the right tenants, uh, or there may be um, uh, you know, uh, business owners that may not understand that that particular neighborhood is looking for their particular service. Uh, so again, these com these problems are very complex uh, and requires different complex solutions. So one of the things we're very uh, focused on is getting uh, data that's consistent and reliable, so we understand what the vacancy issue uh, is in the different diff uh, commercial corridors. Uh, we are pursuing a vacancy tax in Albany uh, because I think you know when you have a landlord uh, that is not using data uh, to figure out um, to price the square footage of their space, um, and they're just using sort of like, uh, I think, because I see a Starbucks on the corner, that I too can also get that particular rent. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that they're thoughtful in the increases that, um, you know, by state law they're allowed to do, uh, but we wanna make sure that they're thoughtful. And if there's a vacancy tax, I think landlords will be thoughtful uh, in terms of uh, what they're charging. What we have seen through our commercial lease assistance program, as I said earlier, is a lot of business owners are actually using our service to start a lease, and they're seeing a lot of success. Uh, so they're getting 10-year leases out of our program, mm -hmm. um, which is important because then uh, you have consistency, and then you have now a, an agreement uh, between you and that landlord in terms of what can and cannot be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about this on Friday, uh, you know, if you are and you have a, a lease uh, that prevents a property tax from being passed through to your or uh, passed through to your rent, um, you now know that you have uh, some uh, stability in terms of the increases that you agree upon. If you don't have a lease, then a landlord has the right to actually do that, and you may not know what the increases will be throughout your time there. So again, there's multiple tools that we are pursuing. Uh, to address uh, the the very issue of vacancy. Uh, I just want to ask one other question about, um, I had heard from uh, a, a building owner, a landlord, about um, the, the, uh, the property taxes that they pay on their commercial space. And that in some areas, it, it's not really commensurate with the amount of foot traffic that they're, that they're getting on certain commercial corridors and, and, um, and that that, in his opinion, was the driver of, or could be, or at times is the driver of of high rents being charged by landlords for commercial spaces. So there, you know, the, it's the cost of the of the property taxes. Are we? Can we examine um, the property taxes that, or the way in in which we are assessing our property taxes? 
um, so that, uh, particularly when it comes to commercial retail spaces, um, uh, so that we're not uh, inadvertently driving up the rent on small businesses. But so I think, and my, uh, I have some colleagues here for the Department of Finance, but I, I think to, to, to answer your question, I think there is a, a, a process right now in evaluating the entire property tax system. Right. Uh, I know I've been at, at several hearings uh, where the mayor has said um, that he wants to have a comprehensive overview and, um, uh, of the property tax system. I think, you know, to your point, um, educating business owners on what that means in terms of triple net leases mm -hmm. um, is important as well uh, because I've had many times, uh, you know, spoken to business owners who, you know, the, the, the landlord passes on the increase of the property tax uh, into their rent um, and they were not aware. Mm -hmm. uh, so for us, what we have done through the commercial lease assistance program is really equip business owners um, with the resources necessary to negotiate an effective lease. Um, but I don't know if you want to add anything about the, um, the uh, property tax. We're going to have to sway you in if you're going to make a statement. If you could please raise, raise your right hand. Oh, sure. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. And if you could identify yourself. I, I was just going to build on what uh, Commissioner Bishop Oh, Sheila Feinberg, uh, representing the New York City Department of Finance. Um, I just wanted to build off of what Commissioner Bishop just said, that I think that is a larger conversation that the New York City Department of Finance is looking into. We understand the issues that you're addressed, that you're raising, and I do, I just want to echo what the Commissioner said. I think it is part of a larger conversation about how we reform the property tax system so that we can meet the needs of many people. Okay, I mean, as, certainly as we're looking at that with the Property Tax Commission, um, I think it's important to examine that really specific question of, of this, the, what the, the kind of retail commercial tax is on, you know, through, I mean, I, I have like a, and how, it's, and how it's determined and how specific it needs to be. Like, so for example, I've heard that Atlantic Avenue um, is, is kind of assessed the same way that 7th Avenue is in Brooklyn even though the foot traffic on Atlantic Avenue is markedly less, and so it's, you know, there, there's, there's not as much opportunity uh, for those storefronts um, to attract customers. And so, um, you know, just how it's, how it's determined, um, uh, what it's based on, um, you know, that's, those are things I think we should be examining. Because again, it's, if, it's a, if, that's, if that's one of the drivers, then that would be very unfortunate. I, I would just add that I think it's certainly part of the conversation, but the way that we do our assessments is based on state law. I don't yeah. know that it really depends on the foot traffic as much as it does the state law, but I understand that. Okay, but it might also be kind of like of cutting off. Foot traffic affects the businesses. Right, I mean, I understand that it's certainly kind of cutting off our nose despite our face if we're, uh, we could, if, if we have, if we're able to keep a business open and collect sales tax, it would be better than, uh, than, than uh, uh, insisting on a higher property tax. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, council member, but before you leave, we like to have our cake and eat it too. Um, last year, $1.5 billion increase in real estate taxes. This year, projected 1.8, 3.3 over two years, and the next three years have projections of billion dollars year over year. I don't, our, our property owners are very sophisticated. They're going to either raise the rent and include real estate taxes, or they're gonna pass it through as those increases come in. The problem is that we're forcing them to raise the rents. And if they can't for raise the rents, they're just gonna give them the increases in real estate taxes. We're creating this condition. And you also have a 3.9 commercial rent tax on top of the real estate tax increases. So. I love the fact that we're talking about their needs and their hurdles and their issues and the competition that's out there and how we want to be supportive. But at the same time, government is undermining them through increases in taxes, water and sewer, uh, dollar amounts associated to fines and violations. And we can't have it both ways. It's either we're going to help them or we're going to be their final nail in their coffin. Thank I you. 
I, I don't know if you wanted us to, to comment on that, but I, I will say that in this administration, we uh, we care about small businesses. We're focused on on the success of small businesses, um, and I have to say that um, you know I have great partners at all the different agencies, including the Department of Finance. Uh, that they hear us, um, and I will continue pressing the message that we have to make sure. Commissioner, let's call for a 2% tax cap then. If it's good enough for the rest of the state, it should be good enough for New York City. Give our small businesses a fighting chance, including our property owners and our tenants. This is a much bigger picture. We put this burden on them. On top of everything else, it's our doing. And this administration has been raising real estate taxes, not the tax rate, real estate taxes at an unprecedented rate. And it's gonna continue. And I know that it's very difficult to balance a budget, but the more we raise, the more we spend. And the more we spend, the more we continue to raise is the real problem. So it's part of the spending habit that we have as well. Um, and I, council member, if you don't mind, time is of I'll, I'll be quick. So you, you teed me up well. I have a bill that's not on today's hearing that's related to the commercial rent tax, which affects my district and a few others in Manhattan. 3.9%, uh, as you mentioned, additional property taxes having to be paid by the renter. She feels unfair, but the geographic boundaries and the existence of it. Um, does the administration have any opinion on a further repeal of the commercial rent tax? So, um, and we worked, uh, again, uh, when we talk about uh, this administration's support of small businesses, uh, about a year ago, uh, we worked uh, to actually um, make changes to commercial rent tax. Um, back then, we had to look at the budgetary impact um, that that would have on the overall budget. Um, and I think, you know, the it, it would be the same working with council to uh, figure out the budgetary impact. Okay, we'd like to work with you on it because still more businesses, I think that should, I think I think no, nobody should be paying it, but I think certainly there's an additional class of, of businesses here that shouldn't be paying it. Um, so we'll, we'll ask you to uh, take a look at that bill as well. Yep. Um, second is on bill number 1408 on the agenda here, which really creates a um, affordable retail uh, component in city economic development projects. I'm wondering if you have any, I, I didn't see it in your testimony, uh, but if any comments related to the affordable housing side of it, which is that um, if we're doing an affordable housing project, I think so occasionally the market rate, the, the small business there will help subsidize the, or the large business will help subsidize uh, the, the housing or the other parts of the project. Do you guys have comments on that, Bill? So I have some colleagues here from uh, HPD can talk more about, about that. I, I would say that, um, you know, the, um, we've piloted this in a few areas. Um, you know, I know in East New York, um, and, and there's a project in East New York that has sort of elements of this, the, the intent of this bill. Uh, there's a, a, a project up in uh, Inwood that has the element. It, it's too early, uh, I think, for, um, for us to tell whether or not this is the right tool. Um, and what we're also not talking about is, you know, when you're looking at these projects, um, in order for these projects to be financed, uh, the banks require, uh, and in certain cases, demand certain type of tenants. Um, so that's also lost in this, uh, that is not actually discussed, and I think that it's worth a conversation uh, to figure out how the financial industry uh, is affecting the look and feel of our neighborhoods uh, based on their willingness to commit to certain developments. Um, but the reason why I didn't touch on that is because that is, um, it's sort of out of our expertise, uh, but I'd be happy to have someone from HPD talk a little bit more about that. Got it. Any other you just wanted to? If you please raise your hand, yeah. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole yes. truth, and nothing but the truth <laughs> in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And if you could please introduce yourself. Uh, Genevieve Michael from HPD. Um, so just building on what the commissioner said there, I think additional concerns with the bill is that as drafted, it would require retail in all of our projects, both preservation and new construction. Um, I think we certainly share the goal of wanting to make sure that projects we are financing uh, create vibrant neighborhoods, but I think this legislation would be overly broad. Uh, certainly around RFP processes, we try to do community engagement and try and encourage 
package uh, retail that works with the local neighborhood. Um, but you know, on some preservation deals, on some other projects, you might have existing tenants already in place that this, I think, bill would actually harm. Um, and additionally, I think really we want to look at these projects on a case-by-case -case basis, not legislation that would mandate it across the board. Got it. Thank you. And, and is there concern it would, it would harm the um, availability of affordable housing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the financing on each project is different, and we don't want to put uh, additional constraints in place that uh, don't allow us flexibility where we need it. Great. Thank you. And I'll ask two more questions, if I can. do quick. One is... Um, uh, the, um, there's a bill in the city council right now that also, I, I think we should actually look at some of these businesses differently in terms of who they are and how they provide services to the city. One of the bills that uh, Councilmember Borelli has is related to restaurants, and I know there are some representatives here, which adds more flexibility in terms of how they can do charges and surcharges, which many have argued would allow them to have more flexibility in their pricing. It's essentially allow them to add in, it's not a Expedia question, uh, it's a, um, allow them to add in um, like a surcharge, which right now you can do it if there's a group of eight, or other thing, you know, and the DCA, I think, came and opposed that bill or, or raised concerns around it. And the, I think you're going to hear from some of the small businesses today in the restaurant industry around their wanting to be able to do that, especially um, there's concerns around uh, stuff that's happening in Albany. I'm wondering if um, the S have you guys have looked at um, that particular bill from there from the SBS side in terms of allowing for surcharges to the restaurants. Yeah, so and we work closely with um, an, um, and we continue to work closely with the industry. I think you, you'll hear from them as well in terms of the work we're doing to help them address the workforce issue. The cost of labor was one of the things that they brought up. Um, you know the uh, we're going to look at different ways, um, and you know as the bill advances, uh, we'll be happy to address some of the concerns that DCA had, which was more so. Um, you know, DC is responsible for ensuring uh, that uh, there's transparency in terms of what consumers pay. Uh, so if there's um, uh, concerns that DCA has, um, you know, and that can be addressed uh, by, um, you know, working with council, uh, I'm sure that, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, have further conversations. Uh, but we are aware uh, that, you know, uh, the industry is interested in figuring out ways to offset their labor costs. Uh, while this legislation is being, um, you know, discussed, uh, we are, again, looking at different ways we can uh, lower their costs in other areas, including, uh, you know, finding labor and also on the regulatory side uh, to reduce uh, fines that uh, restaurants uh, typically face. Okay, my last question, I'm sorry to take so much time, is um, scaffolding. We always hear often in Manhattan about scaffolding outside of buildings yes. and long time uh, impacting, um, impacting small businesses. I had a coffee shop owner one day describe to me how many cups of coffee he needed to sell in a given day to pay his rent, down to that formula and that a scaffolding could take that wiped that equation out. And it was so specific that it yep. made me realize the impact of um, like so even some visibility on a business. And um, I'm wondering what other uh, measures around like scaffolding and other disturbances like that the city can take. I know Councilman Kalos has a bill around limitations on scaffolding. I'm wondering if that's something you guys are looking at in terms of helping. Yeah, so one of the first things I talked about when I became commissioner was about, I mean, we say scaffolding, uh, I think the official name is sidewalk sheds. Sidewalk sheds. Um, and you know, the, the I think we do need to look at that law. Um, I can't remember if it's local law 11 or, or, or whatever um, uh, it is, uh, because if there's any type of loose brick um, on that particular building, the, the landlord is required to put up a sidewalk shed. Uh, we have to look at the design of sidewalk sheds. Um, they tend to be, you know, they're, 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 they're just not transparent. Um, and any time a sidewalk shed goes up, I've heard, uh, I don't have like the the data itself. Uh, you know, businesses uh, revenues drop uh, either thirty to forty percent. And as you know, as we talk about um, small businesses, um, any type of drop uh, could be detrimental to that small business. Uh, so I'd be happy to work with council uh, to figure out ways uh, we can um, make it make those those sidewalk sheds more transparent. Uh, maybe even reduce the the length of time uh, it takes uh, for a landlord to repair. Uh, or to address the concern as to why that sidewalk shed. Uh, uh, because what we have seen is that, um, and what we've heard from small businesses, is that sometimes there's a cost of doing business. The landlord would rather uh, pay the, the fine 
of keeping a sidewalk shed up longer uh, because it takes you know uh, maybe 10 times more to actually fix the actual problem. Uh, so we have to figure out what we can do to help our small businesses there. I know one of the things that we did um, as part of SB1 in terms of bringing and raising transparency is when permits are filed for things like that, um, at least uh, we are aware so that way that business owner will know that you know a sidewalk, uh, a, a sidewalk shed permit has been issued uh, because the other issue is that business owners show up one day and you know, all of a sudden there's a sidewalk shed, so there's no way to plan uh, for uh, the impact of that sidewalk shed on the business. Great. Thank you. And thanks to the chair for having this hearing. Th thank you, council member, and thank you, commissioner. I'm, you know, now that um, I was reflecting a moment with HPD, uh, I hate to predict that the sky's falling, but the sky is actually falling, and perhaps all of the vacancies that we're experiencing will someday become affordable housing conversions. Um, I can't see any other way that we're going to have sustainability in our commercial cars unless we take action now. So HPD, maybe your prayers will be answered. Maybe we will have hundreds of thousands of new affordable housing units on the market at the expense of our small businesses and conversion. Uh, Commissioner, um, we have a slew of people that would like to be heard, but in particular, we have Borough President Gail Brewer here. I'm not sure if you'd stick around. She's to the right there. Oh, um, I, I will sit here for Gail. Any, any, any time, any time. Uh, Gail, Gail has been, a, a, I just want to be on the record to say that Gail has been such a strong supporter of small businesses, um, and at, uh, she's been at the forefront of a number of initiatives, uh, so I'll be happy to sit and uh, listen to uh, her testimony. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and looking forward to continuing our conversations and uh, working uh, dil diligently to help our small businesses, and thank you for your advocacy. We'd like to call up Borough President Gail Brewer. <laughs> Commissioner, you don't greet me like that. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I, I am Gail Brewer. I am the Manhattan Borough President, and I want to thank Chair Donai for holding this hearing on 1472A and all the other bills. Small business is incredibly important. Before I go, I just want to answer thank you, uh, Council Member Powers, because I think in terms of the scaffolding, which does cut down on the possibilities of people visiting that storefront, we've got to use technology, and I have to suggest drones as a way to look at what the cornice issues are and then do scaffolding. I only say this because we've been talking about scaffolding like since 1970s, so I think we have to think of a way of doing something different, so it's an idea because I don't know what else to do. Were you even born council member? <laughs> thought so. We need drones to be able to see what's on that building, and then that would save the time that they put the scaffolding to move around and so on. Something to think about. Um, but we all know that the uh, crisis facing small business, which inspired the Small Business Job Survival Act decades ago, has only gotten worse. Just so you know, I wrote it with Ruth Messenger in 1985, so I'm very familiar with it. National change steadily spread throughout the city, storefronts in vacant. For years, as you know, and online shopping is reducing foot traffic to our local shops. We need to act now, and that's why we're having this great hearing, and I thank you. I am proud to sponsor intro 1472A along with Speaker Johnson and Council Members Rosenthal and Levine. This bill would require property owners to report the vacancy status of their storefront properties to the Department of Small Services, ably represented here by the Commissioner. Owners will also be required to report the asking rent and previous rent of each vacant property, the space's use capabilities, the total square footage, and the owner's contact information. SBS will be responsible for maintaining a regularly updated database with this information on the open data portal, which I passed. New Yorkers will be able to monitor their local businesses and help ensure that property owners are in compliance by reporting vacant storefronts to SBS through an anonymous complaint line 
This data is important because, for instance, we walked from the bottom of Broadway to the top of Broadway about two years ago, and we found 188 vacancies, but we have no idea if that's correct today. As a primary sponsor of Open Data Law of 2012, I know the value of data as you do. It allows us to track and identify issues and measure results. This database will identify vacancy trends throughout the city, spot areas where vacancies are rapidly increasing, and identify specific property owners and managers who demonstrate a pattern of forcing out small business. Additionally, it will be a resource for small business space Everyone I talk to about this issue agrees we need a database. As many of you know, I worked on the SBJSA during my time as a city council staff member with Ruth Messinger, and we have continued to fight on this issue endlessly. Following the October hearing on the bill, I formed a task force on small business looking at these issues and trying to find solutions just as you are. We're all working together. We're trying every possible solution to help small business in our city, including legacy business rent regulation. It's a form of rent regulations for businesses that have been around for more than 20 years, somewhat successful in other cities, needs a look back. Also a provision requiring that small business leases specify the percentage of annual rent increases and other mechanisms by which property owners can impose large increases. Also looking at, at our task force, some form of required mediation or, again, discussion because owners don't talk to the tenants. Mediation to cover proposed increases, maybe zoning regulations to create special enhanced commercial districts, similar to the one that helped to put in place on the Upper West Side. It has been successful, I think, in curtailing the spread of formula retail by limiting the size of storefronts. I wanna thank uh, the city council because on a report that the city council did on retail, they said it was successful. I wanna be honest, city planning commission is yet to do a study that would be perhaps even more intense. Store, we have to make sure that it really works. I'm more honest, I don't know, but it helps. We are discussing how to help small businesses compete with online retail and the digital economy. If we don't address this issue, we will see more and more money flowing out of our neighborhoods, out of our city, and into the large corporations thousands of miles away. Our task force is discussing improving and increasing services for small businesses, including training to create and maintain an online presence, and I know SBS is doing that also, Legal help for businesses and negotiation leases. SBS has also got four people doing that. Assistance with utilizing government resources and training business owners in the use of free accounting and operations software, something that a lot of small businesses don't do. Creating standardized lease provision, something that we very much want to do. And tax reform that reduces the sales tax for transactions completed in storefronts and increases the tax on e-commerce transactions. And I know you had a discussion about the commercial rent tax. I certainly agree with the council member and the whole issue of property tax pass-alongs. When we talk to owners, we say, are you getting a city deduction? No. Are you getting a state deduction? No. Are you getting a federal deduction? No. Are you getting an LLC deduction? No. But we don't understand why they're vacant. We ask. The owners tell me, no, Gail, we're not getting any of those. I don't know. Our goal is to protect the local small business that are essential to the character and identity of neighborhoods, especially the storefronters that have contributed to the stability and neighborliness of communities for many years. There's no single solution to the crisis facing small retail business, as you know, but we must actively reduce the burden with reforms and incentives that are carefully tailored. You know also the issue of um, how do these uh, tenants that are so challenged by some of these retail issues, how do they end up being uh, vacant for so long? And that's the burden that we cannot get our hands around except with one of the suggestions that are coming up today. We need to help the success of these small businesses through close monitoring and adjustment 
including additional legislation in the Council and in Albany if necessary. Thank you very much for addressing this very challenging issue. I appreciate your time. I want to thank you, Borough President, and thank I agree you. with you. Information is so vital um, on the vacancies so we can actually not only have a better understanding, but come up with an act, a plan of action to address you it. Need the data. You did mention something I'm hoping that you'll elaborate a little bit. What type of special protection would you think of giving commercial corridors? Would that be in the form of real estate tax relief, um, similar, and maybe we can get very creative. Uh, well, we're familiar with Scree, Dree, no, I propose Tree. Yep. Should we come up with Cree? And that would be uh, commercial rent increase exemptions that perhaps we can put. Absolutely. So I'd like to work on that with you. Yep. Because I truly do believe that real estate tax burden uh, is equally significant uh, of a problem as much as rent yep. burden is. I totally agree with you because the pass alongs are huge and you never quite know. For instance, the store next to you, I get complaints. How come they're getting X to pass along and I'm getting Y pass along? They have no information as to why X and Y. And the second issue is I have to say that in terms of SBS, the most popular new program is the commercial strip one where you can apply for a X amount of dollars, just literally cash to help you as an interesting local business. So it is about the money. It's not just about the online and some of the other challenges. So I think your, your C is a good idea to pursue. I'm looking forward to working on this with you. Thank you so much, Thank Brother you President. very much. Can we please uh, invite up Akeem Walker, Bonnie Slotnick, Mohammed Ateja, and Len Afridi. Lennon. I just want to point out that um, in the interest of time, we're going to be capped at two minutes, so please stay within that time frame. And we'll begin from you, young lady, and we'll move. And if you provide a written testimony, sometimes it's best just to sum it up in your own words rather than read it to stay under the two minutes. It's but I'll leave it up to your discretion. Is this on? Okay, good morning. My name is Bonnie Slotnick. I'm the owner of a 22-year-old cookbook store called Bonnie Slotnick Cookbooks, which is now very happily on East 2nd Street. But what happened to me before I found my spot on East 2nd Street is reflective of all the bills. Um, I encountered problems that all these bills probably would have stopped. My previous landlord, HM Village Realty, refused to renew my lease after 15 years after offering me only a three-year lease, they suddenly, in 2014, said, we're not gonna discuss your lease with you. There was no rent increase discussion, there was just no, no phone calls, no letters. I ran into my landlord on the street and he got in his car and slammed the door. In that space, I had been subjected to the property tax issue. The first year, I was suddenly billed for $800 for property tax, which I was not expecting at all. 14 years later, by the time I left, my monthly property tax bill was equal to my rent. It literally doubled my rent. Um, there were building problems. There was a leak in the ceiling, which is really as bad as it gets for a bookstore. Suddenly I had a cascading leak in the middle of a weekend afternoon. It took weeks to fix that. I didn't get any restitution for what was damaged and there was an infestation of mice from the restaurant in the basement. I had to pay for the exterminator and I had to pay the DOH fine because I was the one who called it in. Um, if I had, if the, uh, 
if the certificate of no harassment bill had been in effect, I never would have rented from this landlord. He wouldn't have been in compliance with it. And certainly when I left, he wouldn't have been in compliance with it. Um, when I found out that my lease would not be renewed, I got the word out through Jeremiah Moss blog, Vanishing New York, and I got a lot of publicity, and even State Senator Hoylman called me, I'm in his district, and offered to help me, and I knew that he, he couldn't help me. Um, as long as there are real estate entities like Croman and Icon Realty, landlord harassment is gonna continue, and commercial tenants are gonna need all the help they can get from city council. And I really appreciate your help. Thank you. Did you ever reopen your bookstore anywhere else, or have you been closed? Have you oh, reopened? I, I had an incredible stroke of luck, and I found a very sympathetic landlord. So I'm still open. Glad that you're still around. Thank you. If you could just introduce yourself with name and two uh, minute clock, please. My name is Minister Akeem Walker. My wife and I own a small um, natural hair and beauty uh, blow-dry boutique in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, we're new business owners. Um, we worked very hard for many years. Uh, this was a dream of ours. We lived in the neighborhood of East Flatbush, uh, Church Avenue for 20 years uh, plus. My mom owns a home there. Um, it was a big dream of mine to always uh, have a b small business, um, especially um, in the neighborhood which I grew up. Um, so when a flower shop on the corner of my mom's block uh, where I grew up became available, uh, I kind of, you know, rushed in and uh, got, grabbed the spot. Me and my wife, uh, we renovated. Um, we went through, we didn't know everything that, you know, we needed to know about Department of Buildings and the, and the codes and everything of that nature, but we were willing to learn as we were going. Um, turns out the landlord, um, he, he um, the landlord be became very uh, aggressive when we started to point out some minor things that needed to be fixed. Um, right now we have an issue with our plumbing. Um, we bought in um, with our renovator, he didn't have an uh, uh, adequate plumber at the time. So we bought in a friend of the families who turned out to not be licensed. That turned out to be a whole hoopla, but um, he follow suited what the landlord had as, as in piping. Um, the landlord had illegal piping in his basement um, we addressed the issue. I told them that no one is willing to work with this piping as long as you don't have it changed. So his uh, counter to that was to uh, change all the piping and rip out our drainage, completely crippling our um, storefront. So now everyone in this, uh, attached to his building, which uh, tenants upstairs and the laundromat have water, but we have none. Um, we have no drainage. Uh, I'm so sorry, we have no drainage. Uh, this is KSK Properties. Uh, he refuses to fix it. He refuses to do anything according to it. Every time we bring in and someone to fix it, he says, well, they have to be approved by me. He doesn't want to uh, work with us to in timing, and he's just being completely irrational, and he doesn't care. And this is why we're here today for, you know, to to try to push this bill to, so that landlords will be held accountable for the things that they do. I'm grateful to you for your testimony. I want you to meet with my chief of staff. I wanna be very helpful to you uh, to the extent that I possibly can uh, to help you out with this. That, that's just absurd. Thank you Thank very you. much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mohamed Atiyah. I am the co-director of the Street Vendor Project. We are a part of the coalition United for Small Business, NYC. So I was a former vendor. I've been selling food for nine years, so I can tell you how hard it is to be a street vendor. We are the smallest version of small business owners. And every vendor in the street, including myself, we've been looking for that day to be able to start a real, like, big small business, not just be in the street for our whole life. Nobody wanna spend their whole life in the street. They wanna go to have a roof on the top of their heads at some point. And with the way the city is, with the way the regulations are, it's very hard, it's very complicated. The landlord have sort of absolute power. They can do whatever they want, and it's really, really hard to just get a small business started. So you can imagine how difficult it is for new immigrants like myself and 
thousands or maybe millions of people live in our city who want to start their own business, but they cannot afford it. They cannot afford the skyrocketing rent. They cannot afford to deal with the harassment and the legal services they need and the legal assistance they need that they cannot really afford, uh, much less than what we deal with as street vendors with the permitting process and the permitting issue and the underground market, it makes it really, really hard. Now we have seen a lot of people who used to have restaurants are going to be street vendors. They're going to have cars and trucks because they cannot afford to keep their lease. They cannot afford to renew the lease. Once the lease is over, we hear the story all the time, the landlord double and triple the rent. So where is the city in all of that? We understand that a lot of steps need to be taken and this is a great step. We are supporting and true. 1473, 1470, 1049, 1410. We believe this is the first step on the very large way that the city needs to take and need to take a lot more steps to just make sure things are moving forward and the city is actually keeping our culture the way it is. We don't want to see New York City just be like a big home for big corporates and the new immigrants and I would say the poor people cannot find room in it. That would be really sad, so thank you so much for that. Thank you, I'm also the son of uh, immigrants and I completely understand what you're going through and um, this is a, our immigrants are a resource um, and they also contribute to the city more than we recognize, so thank you. Thanks so much, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, thank you Chair Jonah and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Lena Fridi. I'm the Director of Economic Development Policy at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, ANHD. Um, ANHD convenes United for Small Business, NYC, or a citywide coalition of community organizations fighting to support and protect New York City's small businesses from the threat of displacement. We particularly focus on owner-operated, low-income, minority, and immigrant-run businesses. And um, we're al also the folks that you saw outside on the City Hall steps this morning. Um, so I'm just gonna read some of this really quickly. I think that folks on this panel have already summed up a lot of what needed to be said. The voices of small businesses are the ones that really need to be heard here, so thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, uh, USBNYC applauds the council's newly released package of small business bills. We've been urging transformative changes to the small business landscape in, in neighborhoods across New York for years, and this package is an exciting response to that advocacy. While both residential and commercial tenants in New York are at risk, of, at risk of landlord harassment and subsequent displacement, commercial tenants lack meaningful rights and protections. It's past time that the city acknowledge this reality by clearly defining the rights of commercial tenants and taking necessary action to protect those rights. The small business package represents a significant step forward in reaching those goals. Um, I particularly want to highlight the importance of the commercial CONH bill, um, Council Member Gibson's bill, that's intro 14, 1410, um, and Council Member Mark Levine's bill, intro 1470, which would establish a small business's right to counsel. Um, right to counsel is extremely important, and ensures that commercial tenants facing displacement have accessible re legal representation. Um, we also want to make uh, really shout out the work of the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment to establish a residential certificate of no harassment in 2017 and the work that they did to get a right to counsel for residential tenants. We need the same thing on the commercial side. Um, we also want to highlight the importance of intro 1473, which will for the first time establish a res registry for commercial spaces that have remained vacant for more than 90 days. Um, while all of these bills are really important and provide a great step forward, creating protections for commercial tenants, we do have to say that they can't come at the expense of affordable housing. Um, while we recognize the read for need for affordable retail space in New York, we can't support um, the bill that would require low-priced ground floor retail space because it doesn't need, it do there's no, there's no um, gap financing, and so that puts affordability at risk for um, the nonprofit affordable housing developers that create those spaces. So we're happy to have more conversation around that. Um, we just don't wanna, we wanna make sure that residential tenants are not pitted against commercial tenants. That's not the intention of the work that we're trying to do here. Thank, Thank you. you for bringing uh, that out <coughs> and to our attention. Uh, we, we do that too often. We pin one against another um, to alleviate our own, ourselves becoming the target but you're absolutely right, and there's going to be much dialogue in the near future, and thank you for the passion uh, this morning uh, with rallying the troops out there. It goes a long way. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Next, we'll call up uh, Andrew Riggi, Rob Bookman, Kathleen Riley, and one more. 
And we'll bring up um, Loisent Gordon. Start over here. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit association representing restaurants and bars uh, throughout the five boroughs of New York City. Now, something bad is happening in our industry. Back in 2014, uh, there was almost 7% uh, consecutive annual employment growth. Fast forward today, or I should say the end of 2018, it dropped to minus, <laughs> almost minus 2% growth. And this is since the increase of the tip wage uh, has doubled. And there are a lot of fundamental changes going on, and that's why we need business reform. Uh, on today's bill, uh, 1466, which would create a regulatory review panel, we support this bill. Uh, years back, under the last administration, there was similar legislation that was passed. All of the regulatory agencies were, were required to review the fines and violations they issued to small businesses. Uh, they came back, unfortunately, with almost nothing. Even the Department of Health, which was mentioned before, out of the countless ish violations they issue restaurants, couldn't find one, not one violation to say, we'll provide you an opportunity to cure. So we hope this legislation gets passed, and we also hope that it has the teeth to ensure that all the different agencies come back to the table with meaningful cure periods and warnings before monetary penalties are issued. Uh, we also uh, support uh, the compilation of uh, all the rules and laws governing small businesses. We think this would be helpful, uh, so we are supportive. Further, uh, we would like to see uh, intro 408, which would provide um, affordable rents for commercial establishments in certain development spaces. We think this would go a long way in help preserving uh, some of our small businesses. However, we did have some questions about the 30% uh, ownership. There are many small business owners that are small business owners, but they have a little larger than 30% ownership in another restaurant or another bar. Um, and just because they do own another business doesn't mean that they're not struggling uh, to stay open at another location. Uh, so we'll submit some additional comments, but again, we think the streetscape of New York City is vital to keeping New York City the restaurant nightlife capital of the world. And to do that, we need to know what's going on in the streets. So the bills that will help compile uh, the list of vacancies and other related data would certainly uh, be helpful. So again, we're supportive of these bills and we think the uh, council needs to act quickly. And we hope that the de Blasio administration particularly with the regulatory review panel, uh, is committed to making this happen. When he was then candidate uh, for mayor, uh, he believed that this bill didn't go far enough. So now that he is the mayor, we hope that this bill goes farther than he had anticipated, and we provide cures for the countless violations issued to businesses that do not impact the public immediately. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Any order? Yes, right. good afternoon. My, uh, my name is Loison Gordon, and I'm uh, here today to, uh, I, I own a Historic Nears Tavern. Uh, I'm here to represent not just a small business, but also small uh, local historic businesses that's, um, that's vital part of this uh, New York City. Uh, and really, I just want to reiterate, um, as a historic local business that's uh, approaching 190 years, we really would like to see these things go through to at least make 200 years in, in 10 more years. And I, I really didn't uh, you know, understand the cultural value of, of these businesses uh, when I jumped in and tried to help this local business until something happened and uh, it was a gentleman that jumped into, pretty much like approached me when I walked through the door one day of this restaurant and he said, uh, I want to thank you for keeping Historic Nears Tavern open. And uh, I said, no, no problem, we all did it together. We're a community. After all, I can't drink all the beer and the, and the burgers, right? And, uh, 
he said, I don't think you understand. And he said, you know, my, uh, my father and I, we weren't really close, and he loved this place. Uh, you know, he, this was like his second home. And uh, unfortunately, he died really suddenly, and uh, I felt kind of a hole that I didn't have uh, the forewithal to actually try to get to know him. And this was the only place that I can go back to and actually get to know him. And now I'm sitting in his seat in his favorite place, having a beer. It's almost like I'm having a beer with, the fa with my father. And, uh, and right then, I kind of really got the, got the value, uh, not just, uh, you know, just the, the, the monetary value of, of owning a business and thing, but the cultural value that uh, the small local historic businesses uh, that we invest, that these people invest in. And uh, we, I really would like to uh, point out that um, leaving small businesses to fend for themselves against like predatory practices that we talked about today, it, 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 for me it's like giving a free reign to uh, developers to, to fill in Central Park with skyscrapers. And I believe, uh, you know, New York City small business is our Central Park, you know, and uh, we need to find ways to protect them. And it's not only about uh, ma maximizes the monetary investments, but also our cultural investments that the small business and small business owners already made in the city. And we need to uh, help them as much as possible. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kathleen Riley, and I'm the New York City Government Affairs Coordinator for the New York State Restaurant Association. We are a trade group, and we represent food and beverage establishments in New York City and throughout New York State. I'm here today to voice the industry's support and appreciation for the many helpful proposals we've been discussing today um, in an atmosphere where costs are constantly growing, including rent, minimum wages rising, and regulation is ever tightening. Our businesses, uh, including restaurants, are desperate for some relief. Uh, for City Council, knowledge is power, and some of today's proposals, including intros 1049, 1472A, and 1473, would require the city to conduct studies, <coughs> excuse me, conduct studies and maintain databases of commercial properties and vacant commercial properties, as well as the state of storefronts in general. For a body that does an enormous amount of legislating to affect the commercial landscape in New York City, uh, city Council is wise to suggest gathering data on the current state of affairs. With data in hand, City Council will be better positioned to make informed decisions on future legislation, as well as evaluate the impact, both intended and unintended, of past legislation. NYSER supports this goal and is eager to see how data-driven legislation could look in the future. For business owners as well, knowledge is power, and a second grouping of today's proposals, including 1467, 1470, and 1471, would facilitate small business owners access to information on applicable city regulations, legal expertise, and crucial business trainings. Small business owners know their businesses and they know about serving their communities, but they're typically not government or legal experts. They want to be compliant, they want to correctly and wisely proceed through the legal system, but often are limited by a lack of familiarity with these institutions. Well-intentioned people doing their best to follow all the rules shouldn't be punished by complexity and a lack of transparency. They should be assisted however possible. And NYSER fully supports providing legal services to small businesses facing eviction. Finally, compiling an easy to navigate database with the disparate regulations from various agencies all together in one place. Uh, furthermore, we support SBS increasing their services to support existing struggling small businesses with trainings covering topics such as e-commerce, new business systems, and marketing. Finally, NYSER supports intro 1466, which would call upon the city's departments to evaluate existing regulations across all areas to see if real, any rules can be repealed or if cure periods can be provided. This is pure common sense. It's something the business community has been calling for. And at a hearing held by this committee at the end of January, addressing the state of the restaurant industry, one of the most persistent requests made in testimony was for the city to consider adding more cure periods, especially for violations that do not pose immediate risk to the public. With thousands of regulations on the books, it seems more than likely that some have become redundant or obsolete and can be repealed. NYSERA fully supports the goals of Intro 1466. In conclusion, we truly support and appreciate the work being done by this committee today, putting forward so many helpful proposals. Between them, the city and its business owners will have the benefit of greater access to useful information, which can be implemented to help everyone succeed. This, uh, these are laudable goals. We at NYSERA look forward to a continued collaboration with this committee and all of city council to accomplish them. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Rob Bookman. I am counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance, uh, Andrew's group next, door, uh, next to me and the New York City New Sin Operators Association. I've been working with the council for over 30 years on small business issues. Uh, 
it's deja vu all over again. Uh, next month is the sixth anniversary of Local Law 35 from 2013 when the council passed requiring the six regulatory agencies to review all their rules and regulations, come back to the council with a report on which ones uh, could be a warning and education without a fine first, without sacrificing public safety. Uh, the Bloomberg administration was brought kicking and screaming into that, and in December of 2013, the last month of the administration, they came back with just indoor sign violations, nothing else from any agency, and the health department even exempted itself from that. Uh, then, then candidate de Blasio called it window dressing and promised to take action. Six years later, we're still waiting for that promise to be fulfilled, and we hope the council goes ahead and fulfills that. Regulatory burden and fines and compliance costs associated with all of that is the single largest issue that small businesses uh, cite in difficulty in, in doing business in New York City and national surveys year after year. The council itself in its documents and when they passed Local Law 35 quoted such a survey uh, from the National uh, Independent Business Association. Nothing has changed in the last six years. They say they've reduced fines by $45 million, but they don't tell you from what. Is that a 5% reduction or is, is it is a 10% reduction? Uh, anecdotally, we know that there are hundreds of millions of dollars in fines and compliance costs associated with those fines and time taken away from your business to go defend on those fines. One example is the health department. When Mayor Bloomberg took office, our world famous restaurant industry had $12 million a year in fines. When he left the office, it was $52 million a year in fines. Same restaurant industry. Um, that this administration has reduced it to $40 million a year and take credit for that, still we've gone from 12 to 40. And we see that over and over again. Um, that one bill here, which gets that moving again to me, is the single most important thing that you can do to force the administration to focus on educating small businesses, working with them when there's no public safety issue involved, offering them an opportunity to cure, and only then, if they don't cure, come back and issue a fine. I want to thank you for mentioning that. SB1's primary goal was to remove old, antiquated laws and rules and regulations. Year four, $36 million, they modified 80, which means we made them worse. But, Listen, uh, SBS- How many people were the survey that you refer to? Excuse how me? How many businesses were part of the survey? That was a national survey cited by the council six years ago. It says, according to the biggest difficulty in facing small business, according to the National Federation of Independent Businesses' most recent survey, of course, that's six years ago, 21% of small businesses list government requirements and red tape and fines as their single most important problem, which is indicated more often than any other clause, including sales and rents. This comes from the council's own documents. I want to say that SBS is a is they the good guys in the administration as far as we're concerned. It's the regulatory agencies that you need to get up here, the ones who are keep issuing these fines. And I gotta, I, I gotta say, you guys decide their budgets. They're gonna, come, they're gonna be coming to you shortly with budgets, and in those budgets there are lines for fines. The council needs to stand up and say it's too much. We're not gonna approve that budget with that amount of fines in it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, thank you. I know Ms. Riley testified uh, that your organization supports intro 1473, and I'm not sure if the other three of you testified uh, specifically that you support 1473. Is that a? Uh, which number, which? Uh, the three is the, of is the registration of, pro of vacant properties. Yes. Is that we a do. yes? Yes? Yes, yes, okay. You all testified, I think, in some way or another about overregulation, burdensome fines, burdensome fees, and the sort of nickel and diming to death uh, that small businesses endure. 1473 would require a registration of uh, vacant property within, that has been vacant for more than 90 days, a, uh, an update every 90 days thereafter. It would impose a fee on the registration itself, and for the failure to register and update, it would impose a penalty of $1,000 each week or a portion thereof. You've all testified in some way or another of the burdensome uh, fees and the, and the uh, foot on the neck of small business in this city uh, imposed by the government. Are you okay with $1,000 a week for not registering a property in accordance with this new statute that nobody knows about? I, I don't represent the real estate industry. I think a yes, it's a yes or a no, sir. So you're a lawyer. I think you should speak to them about it, but uh, you, generically you I would it. say no. I am not in favor of more fines on small okay. business owners. Sir? 
Mr. Riggi? Am I? Am I, I? I don't represent the real estate I'm asking, industry. I'm asking you if you support a thousand dollar a week penalty on failure to register. No, do I? Okay, good, sir. I'm, I'm not sure if you're addressing it to the right people, to be honest, so well, I, I have no comment. Okay, and well, we already know because I read your testimony and I heard you, so you said yes, that's okay. Um, but thank you very much and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, panel to testify is uh, Taylor Kabiri of the Municipal Arts Society, Harry Bubbins of Village Preservation, Danielle Christensen of God's Love We Deliver, and Marianne Rothman of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums. And we're gonna ask that you try to stay at the two minute mark, please. We have quite a few more that have uh, signed up to testify. Um, and we'll start from left to right. Good afternoon, my name is Taylor Kaybay with the Municipal Arts Society of New York. <coughs> is it on? Am I talking quiet? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, I'm with the Municipal Arts Society of New York. And MAS commends the New York City Council for its recently released package of small business bills. For more than a century, MAS has been a leading advocate for the character and vibrancy of our city's streets, which is connected to the health of our small business community. While we are supportive of the legislation set forth in the small business package in its entirety, certain bills best adhere to MAS's values. Intro number 1049-2018 requires the Department of Small Business Services to conduct routine evaluations of the state of the storefront business environment in every community district at least once every five years. This is a crucial first step in engaging the changes in street streetscape composition over time and identifying those neighborhoods most in need of protections. Further assessment criteria promulgated under this legislation includes a variety of factors such as district demographics, number of vacant storefronts, community involvement, and opportunities for promoting a vibrant mix of commercial uses and improving the built environment. The flexibility provided by these factors will allow SBS to fairly and adequately assess the overall health of small businesses. This in turn has the potential to better inform decision makers who will continue to update and improve the parameters of legislative protections as the issue of commercial tenant harassment and displacement evolves. MAS supports intro number 1408, which would require developers of projects receiving one million or more in financial assistance from a city agency or economic development entity to provide affordable ground floor retail space at such projects. Intro number 1408 would promote small business entrepreneurship opportunities while fulfilling local retail needs and reducing vacancies. The creation of a public online searchable database of all taxable permit premises and the monthly rent for such premises as delineated in intro number 1472-2019 would promote greater transparency and equity in commercial landlord tenant lease negotiations and or renewals. MAS believes that the database will provide a vital mechanism for the collection of necessary data that can be monitored and analyzed to determine trends and or areas of particular fragility for small businesses. Intro number 1473-2019 requires the owner of any storefront property to register with SBS. Um, MAS supports this bill because it addresses commercial vacancy directly through the imposition of monetary penalties. Thank you, and I just wanna bring up uh, Laura O'Reilly uh, to fill in one of the vacant seats. Great, hi, I'm Harry Bubbins. Good afternoon, council members. I'm testifying on behalf of Village Preservation, the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, the largest membership organization in Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. Small, independently owned stores in our neighborhoods, as in so many New York City neighborhoods, face tremendous pressure, and in the last few years we have lost an increasing number of long-standing local small businesses due to unsustainable rents and landlord intransience, among other factors. It's vital that the City Council do something. We believe that the single most important thing the Council can do is pass the Small Business Job Survival Act, which we have been working towards and hope will be released for a vote soon. We know there are some important issues that need to be worked out there, but we also know that time is of the essence on this issue. We do believe that some of the bills before you today could provide some additional assistance to small businesses. We particularly believe that intro 1410A requires a certificate of no harassment prior to the approval of building permits and broadening the definition of commercial tenant harassment and intro 1470 providing legal services to small business owners facing eviction could be very helpful. 
Too often, small businesses are pushed out of their spaces with little recourse or ability to fight back. Anything that would even the playing field or prevent or discourage landlords from harassing or wrongfully evicting retail tenants would be welcome. However, at the end of the day, what most businesses need to be able to stay and survive is help to ensure that they are offered a lease renewal at a fair and reasonable rate which reflects the market and which they can afford. While the SBJSA does that, none of these bills would. So while they may help, they do not address the core problems that many small businesses face. We hope that the Council will do that. In addition to moving on the SBJSA as soon as possible, we would also urge the Council to further explore the possibilities of a vacancy tax to discourage property owners from keeping their storefronts empty while they wait for an unrealistically high rent for their space. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My next? Hi, Laura O'Reilly. I'm the CEO and founder of a company named Wallplay. Um, I am a small business owner. I made it into my sixth year, luckily past the fifth. Um, my company is unique in that we program and operate vacant retail spaces until landlords secure permanent tenants. I have 20 spaces on Canal Street right now that my company operates and programs. And I am here in favor today of the registry. Um, I do not believe in the penalty, but if you do not have a process that encourages people to actually list their vacant storefronts, it's you know a little hard to necessarily motivate. Um, we are here today, I think it's a complex issue. I am in support of legacy businesses getting the support they need, but I also think that times are changing. I think that e-com IRL and the way that people are selling their goods is changing, and I believe that the future is where we are going to be time-sharing empty storefronts, and it's gonna be modular, and it's gonna be mobile, and it's gonna be fluid. And I believe that if you try to go forth with the registration of storefronts, and with the purpose of the vacancy tax, you're not gonna motivate the landlords. Um, I believe that there should be a never empty reward instead of a vacancy tax, but the first step in the problem is identifying it. So we need the data, okay? And everyone needs to work together. And we have to change this narrative of the evil landlord raising the rent because they are business owners as well, and we need to work together. The vacancy in our storefronts hurts everyone, and it creates a halo effect that makes it hard for anyone to thrive. So what my company does is we come in, we operate the storefronts for short-term use, and we work with small businesses, arts organizations, and brands to host pop-ups. Um, if you come on down to Canal Street, we have 20 installations open, free to the public right now, and we are going to be expanding around the city. We are here to work in partnership with the city, with small businesses, and with landlords. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair uh, John I and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Marianne Rothman. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums. We're the largest of several member organizations to help, that help housing cooperatives and condominiums in the five boroughs and beyond. A significant portion of the housing cooperatives and condominiums in our city have commercial space at the ground floor. When that space is actually owned by the co-op or condo, revenue from commercial tenants supplements the carrying charges paid by shareholders or unit owners, which helps to offset the cost of property taxes, operating costs, and all the rest, keeping home ownership affordable. Co-op and condo boards work hard to find tenants for their commercial space who will be an enhancement to the building and the neighborhood and who will pay on time, will comply with sanitation laws and all other city laws, and who will not create noise or other disturbances. When tenants fail to meet these reasonable criteria, the co-op or condo boards look forward to the expiration of their lease and begin a more careful search for a better tenant. No co-op or condo willingly leaves commercial space vacant for a moment longer than is necessary. There is no better way to mitigate, the, to, to mitigate cost to the, house, to the home owners than to be collecting rent in the building's commercial space. The Council of Co-ops and Condos supports the committee's efforts to assess the state of storefront businesses 
to help owners of small businesses obtain counsel and to understand their rights and responsibilities, and to facilitate small businesses' efforts to locate viably and affordably. Ooh. However, we must express concern with intros 1472 and 1473. Intro 1473 doesn't provide a clear definition of vacancy and its proposed penalties of $1,000 per week for failure to register are unduly harsh, especially for small property owners. In 1470, Intro 1472 would require the city to create and maintain data databases of constantly changing information based on self-reporting by property owners. In an era of diminishing resources, we urge the city to consider other means of data collection and analysis to address the worthy cause of maintaining street streetscapes and retail vibrancy. We're pleased to support efforts to keep our city streets active and vibrant, but we urge that these, n that these be done in a realistic way that doesn't impose lease renewals on the owners of commercial spaces, nor punish them for unavoidable vacancies. Thank you. And I thank you all. As you can see how complex this is, there's four of you, and we have four different opinions, um, but we have a lot to consider, um, and time is not a friend uh, to small businesses. Thank you. Four different opinions. I think your ideas are good. I'd like to welcome up uh, Wilma Alonzo on behalf of the Fordham Road bid, Frank DeLardis of Fordham Road, Michael Brady of Third Avenue, and Will Spisic. And let's bring up uh, Julian Hill. And we'll bring up uh, Laura Sewell. As customary, we'll start left to right. Please try to adhere to the two minute mark. If you've, if you've submitted written testimony, sum it up for us because we'll go through all of your submissions. Sure thing. Uh, good morning, afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, William Spizak. I'm the director of programs at Chaya Community Development Corporation based in Queens. Uh, we work with the South Asian Indo-Caribbean communities to build power, housing, stability, and economic well-being. Last year, Chaya partnered with SBS uh, to conduct a commercial district needs assessment in um, Jackson Heights. Um, and we also partnered with ANHD, who testified earlier, uh, to publish a report on the experience of immigrant uh, small business owners. So we know our neighborhood well. We've collected a lot of data. And the primary takeaway that we have from this experience is that tenants, uh, commercial tenants are extremely vulnerable. 37% of small business owners surveyed in Jackson Heights um, have experienced harassment by their landlord, and 68% said they are rent burdened. I just wanted to highlight two uh, small business owners who were supposed to come and testify, but uh, had to cancel last minute, uh, which is why I'm here. Um, first one is Yamuna, who's a uh, Nepali immigrant, owns a restaurant on 37th Road, um, who has uh, been experiencing ten, um, commercial tenant harassment. Um, her landlord uh, demanded that she sign a new lease. He, he tried to break the lease. Uh, that would double the rent. Uh, when she refused, he began to verbally harass her and um, reduce the power to her restaurant, which resulted in her industrial refrigerators failing and uh, many of her products spoiling, causing her significant loss. Um, just two uh, businesses down, uh, Tashi Lama owns Patala Restaurant, um, has similar experience where the landlord tried to break a lease and raise the rent. Um, after refusing, there was a physical intimidation um, and the uh, landlord demanded that the $6,000 monthly rent be paid in cash, um, which we know on the residential side is a tactic that landlords often use. So all business owners shouldn't have to experience this kind of harassment. Uh, we believe that they should have um, serious protection similar to residential uh, uh, tenants. Um, and we think that uh, you know, City Council is taking um, uh, positive steps with the introduction of these bills. We encourage you to pass them, particularly the commercial, um, uh, the certificate of no harassment. Thank you. Thank you. 
afternoon, Chairman Jenai, members of the Committee on Small Business. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Julian Hill, and I'm a staff attorney at the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. Among other things, CDP offers legal advice to new and existing worker cooperatives, nonprofits and small businesses, works with grassroots organizations, and coalitions to ensure marginalized communities are not pushed out of their neighborhoods, and supports our partners towards racial, economic, and social justice. As you may know, CDP is one of three legal service organizations that is participating with the CLA program, and we're also a member of USBNYC. Um, just briefly, we've served over 60 small businesses over the past year as part of the CLA program, and I'm just gonna make three sort of high-level comments. Landlord harassment, obviously whereby a landlord engages in behavior causing a tenant to vacate their space, is among one of the most common cases that we've been starting to see in our practice. Um, just two examples, Araceli took out a $50,000 loan to open up her dream restaurant. Her landlord refused to timely address important city violations. And months after signing that lease and wasting lots of money and lots of time, she was not able to open. Then there's Natalia, whose landlord removed her boiler after the city inspectors came by. The landlord then refused to replace it, saying that it was her responsibility. Um, and with little to no protection under a lot of these commercial leases and the threat of eviction looming, my clients are terrified. This council passed a bill last session that should provide relief to Araceli and Natalia. They should be able to take, to take their landlords to court. But without access to lawyers who can represent them, the new law's relief is out of their reach. The CLA program only provides support with reviewing, negotiating, memorializing leases, and not for dealing with the actual relationship between the landlord and the commercial tenant. Access to legal representation in these disputes is really important. With respect to certificate of harassment, it would be useful, um, but it's important to think about expanding what harassment actually means, thinking about ways to facilitate improving conditions for business owners, and also providing funding for community-based organizations. Finally, with respect to the vacancy regist uh, registry, um, something that we are also in support of, um, and also echo the idea that it's very important to make sure we define vacancy in a way that um, is responsible and really gets to the core issues at hand. Thank you again for this Thank you. I'm Laura Sewell. I'm the executive director of the East Village Community Coalition. Um, I hear the same stories that we've heard all morning and um, really appreciate the work of the the CLA programs and hope that they will be with us for a long time to come. I'm here to speak about the desperate need for timely data collection. This is an issue that consumes enormous amounts of energy from our community-based organizations, our bids, our community boards. Energy we would all rather spend on programming, events, business attraction to serve our neighborhoods. At every meeting I attend, there's always the same pressing question. How do we not have the data? But the mix of state and local licensing entities and their varying criteria do not give us an accurate picture, leaving us to go out and walk the streets within our purviews time after time after time. Uh, a few years ago, there wasn't anything we could do but throw up our hands, look to unreliable crowdsourcing apps or Google cams that lag six to 12 months behind. Uh, but that has changed. The technology has caught up and there are some promising solutions. The city has an opportunity to take a lead on small business issues, to analyze what works where, and give neighborhoods the opportunity to build on their strengths. We would all benefit from a citywide definition of vacancy, and I think that's one of the things that holds us up here, but um, it's, it's, it's becoming clarified through these conversations, and it's very helpful. We all see the vacancies, the downsizing, the shell game shuffle of businesses taking on the expense of moving a few doors or blocks away to escape a predatory landlord. Not all landlords are bad, but the ones who are, wow. We hear the same infamous names buying up dozens of buildings at a time, and we know what's coming. Many residents are surprised to learn the city's commercial tenants are not included in even the most basic anti-harassment protections that businesses have operated for decades and contributed to their neighborhood's revitalization are often the victims of the very success they helped create. We commend the council for the package of legislation being introduced today. While it addresses many necessary protections, we anticipate it's only the beginning of an improved climate for the beloved micro-businesses that make our city and neighborhood so special. Thank you for the opportunity to come. Thank comment. you. 
Good afternoon, Chair Joni, Councilman Yeager. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Michael Brady, Executive Director of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District and Southern Boulevard Business Improvement District, lo both located in the South Bronx. <clears throat> One neighborhood going uh, undergoing hyperdevelopment and in the full swing of gentrification, with the other being positioned for a future rezoning. I'm also a small business owner owning two brick and mortar businesses along Bruckner Boulevard. I'm here today as I have been at every small business committee hearing because we as a city have not created an environment whereby micro and small businesses can grow nor where small businesses want to or can stay. The New York City Council Small Business Package that has been presented today is a sign that, that this council is paying attention to small business, something that we have not seen coming from New York City in a very long time and a move that we're very heartened with. All the legislation introduced today is not perfect and we look forward to working with the council to hone and develop areas that are inadequate. Those areas include data, intro 1049, intro 1472, and intro 1473, while well-intentioned, lack the proverbial teeth to be of assistance to small businesses and do not provide sustainable, accurate, or reliable data that can be used in litigation. Additionally, many portions of this legislation rest in the hands of New York City Small Business Services. As you know, uh, SBS is a strong partner to the New York City bid, bid Network. However, they have very little enforcement authority, nor do they have stable internal infrastructure or legal standing to collect reliable data, enforce penalties, and move through likely litigation. At first light, a vacant storefront registry is a very good idea. However, it is only a good idea if the information is accurate. Not all vacancies are vacant. Some are in court actions, others are being held over by a previous tenant, and still others are undergoing construction or have long-term LOIs or in prolonged closing processes. Before New York City legislates this process and gives yet another regulation, we would recommend the city establish a framework whereby all vacancies can be understood for what they are. The data must also be maintained with weekly reporting regularity, something this legislation does not outline. In response to intro 1049, while this data collection will be very helpful and in many cases is already being monitored and tracked through various technology platforms, a report published every five years is essentially useless and does not provide the rapid response necessary to compete and monitor changing trends in New York City retail and services. Our recommendation on data, on data would be to go back to the drawing board and present one piece of legislation that tracks all of this information in real time. Other metropolitan cities have similar systems, and best practices should be investigated before we clog the legislative system with repetitive regulations seeking the same or similar information. Uh, business service program offerings, intro 1471 is redundant. I, my thoughts are there. Litigation, we, very, we are very much in support of intro 1410, 1466, 1467, and 1470. However, we would caution the city's law department to undergo significant due diligence to ensure that the city of New York can assist in commercial litigation stemming from eviction proceedings. It's our understanding that there are various liabilities involved with this uh, and they need to be addressed. Uh, regarding 1467, this legislation must also include the law department and not just SBS. Often agencies are constrained or hide behind the law department in the areas of understanding all city small business laws and rules, uh, but also in categorizing and disseminating them. We are firm believers that a commercial developer fund should be established and will work with council member Espinal to ensure that that is, is completed. And lastly, and I know I'm over time, but I think this is something very important that needs to be addressed. Um, it's something that hasn't been addressed at this council and something that I think uh, we as a city like to ignore. In New York City, commercial properties pay in approximately 54% of the tax base, yet only represent 23% of that base. In roughly nine out of 10 commercial leases, a share of the property taxes are passed through to the tenant. When our city raises property tax, we are essentially raising rent on the same small businesses we seek to assist. If we are not going to take a very hard look at that impact, then all of this legislation that we've discussed today is superficial and a Band-Aid on our small business economy. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Great point, and thank you for the work that the bid does in the vital role they play in New York City. We are really pressed for time. We have another committee that's walking into the room, so we're going to ask um, the remaining, if they're here, Jamie Burkerat, Manny Gomez, Evia. I think it's Cardoza. Samantha Rora. Are you here? If who? Yes, Do you mind 
I'm, I'm, no, I'm gonna let her speak, I'll make sure, but you just have to stay on the two minute clock. And if you can sum it up, less than two minutes, please. Bring it closer, you can pull it. There you go. There should be a red light. There we go. Good afternoon, my name is Evia Cardozo and I'm a staff attorney with Volunteers of Legal Service and the Micro Enterprise Project. As legal service providers and a member of the United for Small Business NYC Coalition, we applaud the City Council's commitment to support small business tenants in the city. In general, our microenterprise project provides free legal services for eligible underserved small businesses in New York City. And we offer a variety of transactional services and most recently directly represent small business tenants through the SBS funded commercial lease assistance program. Additionally, we conduct commercial leasing educational programs for small businesses, and we've worked with the city to produce the comprehensive guide to commercial leasing in New York City. As one of the three providers in the CLA program, we see firsthand how the lack of nearly any legal protections results in the potential financial ruin facing small business owners trying to make a living for themselves and their families. We encounter these challenges in our daily practice because commercial tenants are limited to the legal protections found only within the four corners of their often landlord-friendly leases, if such tenant is even lucky to have such a lease. The need for universal provision of legal services for commercial tenants expressed in intro 1470 cannot be overstated. Currently, commercial tenants who cannot afford an attorney rarely receive their fair day in court during eviction proceedings. Corporate entities are statutorily prohibited from appearing pro se in a civil action, and so many small business owners are, uh, sorry. 30 seconds left. M many small business owners um, in financial distress are shut out of the very lawsuit that results in their eviction. On the other hand, when commercial tenants are personally named in eviction proceedings, they are forced to proceed with or without an attorney and too often enter into, uh, enter into detrimental s settlement agreements with pressure from landlords' attorneys. The proposed right to counsel bill would provide critical access to justice for these vulnerable commercial tenants. While we also welcomed the passage of the non-residential tenant harassment law in 2016, we recognize that it must be expanded to provide enforcement mechani mechanisms that hold landlords accountable for their bad actions. Right. Um, I wanna thank you. We, we really pressed for time. I'm sorry, folks, you have your written have testimony. testimony. So if you don't have to refer to your written portion, it's probably best. Sum it up. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. Um, uh, my name is Manny Gomez, uh, Chairman of uh, Sunnyside Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I'm here to voice all the, uh, our uh, small moms and pop stores in our neighborhood, you know, Sunnyside and Woodside. Um, it's so important for the Small Business Job Survival Act that uh, is uh, taking place now. Um, you know, the, these, these businesses are uh, the ones who make the, uh, what it makes so unique, uh, New York City so unique. And unfortunately, it seems like uh, we, we're losing on that because every time that a business uh, closes, you know, it's like uh, now I don't feel like like this is the same New York City that, that I always wanted to, to, to live in and to enjoy. And I think that's it's, it's a big challenge that, that we're having right now. Uh, when we see the vacancies that, uh, as the New York Times mentioned it, over 20%, you know, it's a big concern when in our community we see every every other uh, block, you know, has a vacancy and some of them have say, for, for the past maybe like about more than five years in our community. So it's a big concern when we see that and nothing is taken care of. These uh, 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 places have been just been taken for filmmakers to come in and make the money and uh, leave us, you know. Um, the Small Business Short Survival Act has been in place for over, I mean, or started to take place in 30, 30 years ago. How long more does it have to take for this to pass? You know, come on, it's, it's, it's time for it to pass right now. Uh, when people are, uh, uh, when business owners has the harassment, the fines, the taxes, and now something new as a raw diet. 30 seconds. We have a challenge, as you mentioned, you know, Chair, with, with the raw diets, you know, these are killing the businesses, you know, they cannot bring the, the deliveries into their places. Uh, we are actually getting the ambulances and the uh, fire departments in, in Sunnyside, uh, where we have actually have an ambulance that couldn't get through because they narrow a two lane into a one car lane. Uh, so we see that every, every, every often. Uh, so it's time for the, um, Business Joe Survival, a small business Joe Survival Act to pass now. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Samantha Rauer, and I'm a sta senior staff attorney at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, which is a member of the United for Small Business New York City Coalition. I work on the Commercial Lease Assistance Program, and I'm testifying today to comment on the potential impact of these bills for our clients. You heard earlier from one Brooklyn A client, Akeem Walker, who recently rented out a space for a hair salon in Flatbush, located on the same block where he grew up and lived for 20 years and where he has always dreamed of owning a business. Shortly after signing his lease, as you heard, he learned that there is illegal piping running throughout the building. Upon asking about the issue, his landlord cut off all water supply to his salon and began harassing him with eviction threats. Mr. Walker has already invested roughly $50,000 in building out the space and is now being charged ongoing rent, even though he hasn't been able to open his business without running water. Another of my clients was forced to shut down his dry cleaning business last fall after new ownership took over his mixed use building in Bushwick and issued him a notice to terminate. My client had operated his business in that same location for 20 years under a month to month agreement with the previous owner, which he entered into after moving to Brooklyn from Puerto Rico in the 70s. I spoke with him last Friday and he confirmed that his former space remains vacant. He also told me that most of the residential units in the building are now vacant and that the building is slowly undergoing renovation. All the bills being discussed today would strengthen protections for small business tenants, such as seconds. these Brooklyn A clients, and discourage commercial displacement, in particular intro numbers 1473, 1410, and 1470. Brooklyn A supports these bills, and my written testimony details some additional recommendations including that building owners submit a written lease in order to be removed from a vacancy registry, and that there be a way for members of the public to report vacancies. On behalf of Brooklyn A, thank you for holding this hearing and for this opportunity to testify. Perfect timing, thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Jamie Burkhart. I'm a member of the New York City Artist Coalition. We advocate for the safety and preservation of New York City's small, diverse neighborhood cultural spaces. Uh, we strongly support the introductions discussed at today's hearing. Cultural spaces are small businesses. Cultural spaces closed due to rent, harassment, and eviction. Cultural spaces strive to be in regulatory compliance. Um, so I wanted to focus in and offer some specific recommendations to expand uh, intro 1466 and 1467. Both require reporting on the city's laws and practices related to small business and both have the potential to fill a critical information gap that would help many small businesses more easily discover and navigate the path to legality, safety, and compliance. As a member of the Artist Coalition, I meet frequently with cultural space operators who strive to create and sustain small businesses with limited means. I meet with city agency staff and volunteer de facto community caseworkers who help spaces navigate licenses, permits, certificates, inspections in pursuit of compliance. A common sentiment is the city could provide a clear unified way to understand the path to legality, a map of the process for navigating the city's made many agencies and processes, an answer to the questions every small business must face. Um, so we can expand 1466 and 1467 to create data sets on the city's open data portal and uh, that we and city agencies can build off of to create online tools for New York City small businesses to discover and navigate the path to legality and compliance. Uh, SBS has a step-by-step -step business wizard website that asks operators questions and brings, for brings forward uh, more than 40 permits and certificates. So I'm included here is a list of questions that I'd like to be rows uh, and columns in a data set on the open data portal uh, that have to do with uh, like how long does this take and what are the requirements and how much does it cost? Thank you so much. Can we please bring up the last two and we have to stick to the two minutes Olympia Kazi and Abigail Elman, if they're here. You always save me for last, the best for last. <laughs> always the best for last. <laughs> Dessert comes at the end. Let us know when you want. Uh, thank you. So my name is Olympia Kazi, and I'm with the New York City Artists Coalition. And uh, we advocate for the safety and preservation of grassroots cultural spaces that are critical to our city's vitality. These spaces are talent incubators. They create and support communities, and they are treasured small businesses. Our members are deeply affected by issues of affordability, commercial tenant harassment, and bureaucratic hurdles. 
Uh, we are part of the United for Small Businesses New York City and we support this package of legislation. Uh, we particularly are encouraged from the certificate of no harassment and the right to counsel uh, because they're very important and, and we're happy to see all the other bits. Now I'm going off the record for the two minutes, uh, the, not off the record, off my written comments that you'll read. Uh, but basically uh, the vacancy staff are also very important because they collect the data and, uh, and this is something that we need. I want to take the rest of my time to address Ye uh, Council Member Yeager's point. Uh, we are all for streamlining and meaningful permitting processes and licenses. But uh, when you're asking about why we need these fines, it's because small business services, they, are not, they don't have enforcement. And it's very important that what you guys hopefully will be voting will be enforced. Because as a city, we need to support the small businesses and we're losing them. I want to make sure that you understand that the New York City Artist Coalition supports tackling the challenges faced by small businesses and grassroots cultural spaces from many angles. So we need commercial tenant protections, vacancy control, and a framework for affordable rents. These bills today are important, seconds. but we need to continue because we need to save the cultural displacements that is taking place right now in our city. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of the bills outlined in my written testimony. I'm the Director of Planning and Development at the Cooper Square Committee. We're a community development organization in the Lower East Side. We've been on the forefront of anti-displacement organizing for decades with a particular focus on fighting the predatory landlords and developers. And unfortunately, harassment is a well-documented part of their business model. And until very recently, we really had no tools to protect commercial tenants in buildings experiencing harassment. We're proud to be part of USBNYC and to have been behind the advocacy that created the first commercial anti-harassment law. Um, and it was a good start, but we clearly need more tools to fight back. We recently conducted a survey of businesses in the Lower East Side, and a quarter of them had experienced harassment from their landlord. And I'll just share uh, one quick story of many, um, you heard from Bonnie Slotnick earlier the name Icon Realty. This is a known bad actor in our community. They own a building in the East Village with seven commercial spaces in the ground floor. Three are currently vacant because of an ongoing maintenance issue that the, they failed to address. And two of these tenants are currently contemplating vacating, one very seriously looking for a relocation space. So what you see is, um, uh, speaking to these, these tenants, is a really difficult decision between uh, signing a lease and having a dream of staying in the neighborhood and building their business or being forced to, to vacate and to uh, be, in the words of one of these tenants, left in limbo. So for this reason, we really strongly support the commercial certificate of no harassment as well as the other uh, bills that I outlined in my written testimony. and just have some additional comments uh, and suggestions, including expanding the definition of harassment to include some of these issues, such as refusal to... Ref to include, I'm sorry? To include some of these additional issues of, har of harassment that we see in the East Village, and to expand the pilot to, to look at other neighborhood conditions besides simply rezone neighborhoods. Thank you so much, and I completely agree with you because I feel like I'm being harassed and evicted out of this room so the <laughs> next committee can come in. Do we have a lawyer in the house that will defend me from this illegal eviction? I just want to thank you all for your time and your testimonies. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>